webinar is now live. Thank you. I'll call it order the uh, Wednesday, April 7, 2021 meeting of the Coasta School Committee. Our meetings continue to be held virtually on account of the pandemic. It's being streamed live on Facebook and Coasta 143 TV. Would all committee members that are present please indicate so in roll call, Mrs. Kaliri? Present. Mr. Kearney? Present. Mrs. Marr? Present. Mrs. St. Ange? Present. I am present, Craig McClellan. All committee members are present at six o'clock p.m. Um, the first agenda item is public comment. Um, this is uh, a time where community members can make comment that are not related to agenda items. They're already on the agenda. Um, if you have comment related to agenda items, please wait until we get to that point in the meeting. I'll give it a moment to see if anyone uses the Q&A feature to make a comment, and then we'll move on. Do not see any public comments, so we'll move on to the next item in the agenda, which is the superintendent's report. And at this time, I would uh, respectfully turn the meeting over to our superintendent of schools, Dr. Patrick Sullivan. Thank you, Chairman McClellan, and it's good to see everyone here. Um, it should be a good uh, meeting. Have some have some very nice uh, presentations and items on it. Uh, Chairman McClellan, before we begin, I, I'd like to make a request uh, because I'm going to be inviting um, Athletic Director Rotundi onto the panel in a moment. Um, I, I'd, I'd wonder if we could move um, the high school turf and track and, well, I'd say the Deer Hill softball field up to the superintendent's report. And then I would, I would wonder if, because he's here, if we could also um, move the uh, high school turf and track up. And I would think they would come after our um, Safe Harbors presentation, if that's amenable to you. But I know that's your purview, We're just kind of thinking out loud on this one. Sure, I think it makes sense, but uh, I would uh, seek a motion from the committee in order to do that. I don't know if there's a motion to that effect to uh, assist Dr. Sullivan with those uh, with that logistical change. Is there a motion to that effect on the floor? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Kearney, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Kaliri, all in favor? Mrs. Kaliri? Aye. Mr. Kearney? Aye. Mrs. Marr? Aye. Mrs. St. Ange? Aye. Hi, Craig McClellan, Dr. Sullivan, that motion unanimously passes, so let's do it. All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll take off here. So obviously it's been a, um, a big week in Cohasset Middle High School, and it's wonderful that for the first time since March 13th uh, of 2020 that we've had all of our students, except for those who have opted to be full remote, but basically, all of our students back uh, full in person. Uh, it's been uh, really heartwarming for me to see that. Um, and, you know, it, it, it goes to, you know, to say we, we, a lot of work was put in uh, to, to make that happen, but it, it, it's really nice to see that um, coming together. I thought I'd start as I did when we had our full in person return for our elementary, just with some photos to kind of show you uh, some of the things that uh, have been going on during the um, last few days to really celebrate our students returning. So I'll just share it. It's nothing fancy, but um, it kind of gives you an idea. First off, uh, really there were a lot of welcoming messages uh, outside but from the um, PSO, inside from students and teachers. And uh, I, I really liked this one just to start off, it was on one of the lockers and at the middle school, it just says the day has come where two cohorts unite and become one community, welcome back. And our students, this is in our middle school, this is during utility period, um, they were happy. You know, as I did when uh, I walked around and Dr. Scollins did uh, with the elementary return, I couldn't help but ask the students, how, how are you doing? Are you liking this? And it was obviously the, uh, not surprising, the middle school students were a little bit more exuberant but um, you know, people were definitely happy to be, ba be back, seeing the uh, seeing the the teachers as one whole class, and um, you know, my feedback from the staff is that it it went very well. I certainly am very proud of the work that the staff is doing to uh, connect the students, both academically and, of course, from a social emotional perspective. Here are some more of those messages. You know, remember to have fun. We got this. They were they adorned almost all of our middle school lockers. 
which was nice to see. Um, our lunch was in full effect. This is lunch, middle school lunch, I believe. Um, and this is our cafeteria. And then of course our um, gymnasium. Just some students coming in. I don't know this student. He probably would hate me to have this up there, but he was on Twitter, so I did put it on here. But uh, our students coming in, it was just nice. So I think uh, uh, a lot of the seniors are, at least a group of them waited in the parking lot and came in together on, uh, you know, on, at, before the school started. And that was really nice to see is this has been the first time for them as seniors to be united within the building. The messages that were uh, in uh, typical Cohasset fashion, I love that uh, the PSO and the teachers and students uh, collaborate to do this whenever we have something happening. But the sidewalk chalk, chalk that uh, adorned the front of the buildings, this is one message to you know, encourage each other. Uh, seniors together at last, 2021, 20, 2021, yep. And um, you know some balloons that were out there blowing away in the wind from the uh, PSO. Some nice touches. Here's a, a high school uh, classroom. See this double thumbs up who said they weren't exuberant. Uh, together again, just some more uh, of the sidewalk chalk is just sort of a collage of them coming in. Uh, it should not go without mention the efforts of our custodians. And I have to thank Sue Owen for her work with this, the principals. Uh, we ordered something like 400 desks that some of which are still coming in, but the efforts to get these off the truck, get them all assembled if they needed to be assembled and to get them placed in the classrooms was really uh, wonderful. And they did it very quickly and, and very well. Also, uh, this is at dismissal. I, I wanna thank, uh, first of all, the bus drivers and the, um, our transportation supervisor, Michelle Parfumors. Um, I wanna thank the Lairds, Richard, and I'm, uh, his wife's name is escaping me. I apologize, but Mr. Gabriella. Gabriella. Thank, thank you, okay, wonderful, wonderful people. Sure, uh, true showing of uh, collaboration from the community. They have a, a real expertise in uh, GPS locating and, um, Again, it's just wonderful to be in Cohasset where you have so many people that are talented and have these expertise and then are willing to put it to use to help the kids. But they really helped us plot out our bus routes and did it um, very well. You know, always adjustments to be made, but the early feedback is that things are going very well. And I, I feel that the drop off and pickup situations are going very smoothly right now. Uh, we know we have another transition when we will have our um, high school students uh, basically um, leaving the building at the same time as the middle school students when we come back after break. But as of now, it's going very well. And I want to thank all the families who have been pacing it out, uh, following that stagger that we put in. That little bit of time has made a big difference and we haven't had major backups. So I'm very pleased with the way it's going. Our timing with the buses is really right on the mark hasn't slowed down our elementary drop off and pickup process at all. And uh, really great work with that. Here's some more kids coming in. Happy first day again, which is kind of uh, interesting. It's I think the latest first day in the history of American schools, I would say. And then I just thought I'd end with this one, just Skippers United. Uh, I could go on there, there you know, be more opportunities to talk about it when we reflect, but um, very happy with uh, the way everything is going and uh, just very proud of the, the students, the teachers, the, the leadership team and everybody, the whole community really to make this happen. Not an easy task. Um, and, you know, we're, we're also being hopefully and hopefully Jenna feels this as a student that we're trying to be very sensitive with it as well. And knowing that this is a, it's a new landscape and it's a, it can be difficult when we've had back and forth and it's, we're, we're all kind of creatures of routine in some way and uh, it, it has an impact on students. So I know our staff has been very mindful of that at both the middle and the high school. So, you know, I don't know if the committee has any questions about the opening, um, but I'd be willing to answer them. I know Jenna will probably talk a lot about that as we go. Uh, maybe I'll have Jenna, Jenna, maybe I'll have you update um, on, you know, what you've been experiencing and 
I know we're going to talk as a superintendent's advisory council next week. I said I'd give it a week to let you guys really get a feeling. I know it's only Wednesday, but um, maybe tell us a little bit about how it's going and anything else you want to mention. Yeah, definitely. So, hi, everyone. It's great seeing you all again. I hope you've all been well. Um, <laughs> it's been obviously a very busy and exciting week at CHS as April has been the new September. Um, and it's pretty crazy to think that tomorrow is going to be my first Thursday back in school in over a year. Um, so <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. But um, it's been pretty great seeing everyone. And I'm very happy to see all the old get new faces again in the building. Um, and overall, like up through Wednesday, it's been a very smooth transition. And although some of the classrooms seem a little bit crammed at first, the teachers uh, have been very well prepared. And that's something that I wasn't so sure that they would be just because it's just like, it's such a big adjustment, um, obviously, and this, especially this late in the year, but they have been very well prepared and they've made the transition so easy for the students and have wasted very little class time on um, trying to get all the kids in the seats. And it's just, it's worked really well, thank, like thanks to them. Um, and they've been very accommodating with going home for last period remotely. Um, that's been something I've been very thankful for. And we've had a lot of freedom being remote, being at home remotely last period. They've given us kind of independent work time. And I know a lot of the teachers have been working together on making sure that our last period gives us time to come home, decompress, eat our lunch with our masks off and just enjoy our time at home um, to try to ease back into the week five days in person. Um, and other than that, parking at Milliken has been very easy for the juniors. And I know that's something that we were all a little bit concerned about at first. Um, but honestly, I thought that it made things less stressful. Um, pulling, out of the, pulling out of the student parking lot is one of the most stressful parts of my day by far. And it just makes it so easy. And I find that we get out even faster. Um, and there's been plenty of extra spots. And there's been no issues with um, students not finding a parking spot. Um, just some general feedback that I've gotten from the students and actually from some of the teachers is that we, the breaks, the five minute breaks in between each period is a little bit awkward because it's not, it doesn't give us enough time to, um, you know, take off our masks and have a snack and uh, drink some water, but it's too much time for just walking from class to class, if that makes sense. So um, some of my teachers aren't really prepared to do a lesson for the kids, like, because they're kind of coordinating one class coming out and the other class coming right back in. Um, so I think maybe one long, one longer break and one shorter break would make more sense for um, this learning plan. But that's minor, minor issue. And this week overall has been so fun and so easy. And I think it's just been a great way to ease back into things. Um, on other, on other terms, Spirit Week this week was really a really fun way for us to you know generate some school spirit coming back on monday everyone wore their cohasset gear which i thought was a super cool way to you know come back into the building and everyone was roughing cohasset um and other than that every everyone's just kind of getting situated like i mentioned getting back into the full week routine and i know that um the seniors are super excited for all their opportunities come springtime um and you know football has been good in spring sports people are looking forward to um, yeah, other than that, everything's been great. That's great. Thank you, Jenna. And that's ac excellent feedback on the breaks. I know that, you know, one of the rules that we followed throughout this whole thing is just to reflect and make adjustments so that I know that'll be, I'm sure that's shared and that that'll be important feedback, particularly for uh, Principal Scott and uh, Assistant Principal Noyes. Is I know they're meeting with their faculty this week. So that that's great to hear. And of course, a lot, it wasn't designed because of this. We really need to be able to set things up appropriately for you. And we weren't gonna be able to do that until after break, but it does provide a bit of a transition for you and for us, as we kind of get ready for having you here the full day uh, after the break. So that, that's great. Any questions for Jenny? You covered a lot. One thing that uh, Jenna mentioned Spirit Week, we also had Mental Health Awareness Week, which I know ties very well into our, our first guests when we talk to uh, Nicole and to Laurel, if it's Laurel, right? Um, it is uh, Mental Health Awareness Week. And I don't know if you saw that happening, Jenna, or had any role in that, but that was nice to see. Especially last week, 
um, that was awesome. We got last period off and we played some games on the turf all together. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a great way to relieve stress and, you know, get to spend some quality time with our cohort A before this week. And that it was just super fun. I agree. That was really nice to see. And uh, I just, I love the effort and the intentional focus on, you know, being mindful of what we're going through. And it, it, Mental Health Awareness Week is something we observe every year, not just during a pandemic, but it has a certain resounding, uh, you know, feature to, uh, characteristic to it in the times we're in. That's wonderful. Um, school committee, any questions for Jenna as we kind of get into the pull in person a little bit more? It's Mark. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, thank you, Jenna. That was a, a great presentation, and it, it's uh, great to see Dr. Sullivan's pictures and hear your enthusiasm. Uh, you mentioned the sports have, you know, we're in the middle of fall too, which is football, and spring sports will start soon. Um, Mrs. Moriarty had provided earlier in our school, in the school year, you know, a kind of an outline of things that were going on, going on with the arts and some of those extracurriculars. And I'm wondering if you, if there are plans to kind of ramp it up a little bit now that everybody's back full time and um, add to maybe some of the more in-person meeting of, of different activities and clubs. Yeah, you know, um, I'm not really sure about like specifically the arts, but um, I know maybe Nicole will talk a little bit about this, but I know Safe Harbor, we're coming back and meeting in person moving forward. Um, and I'm pretty excited about that, but hopefully, um, all like these other clubs and I know the arts that's very important um, for them to meet in person um, and I have chorus again next semester um, and we'll be going outside or next quarter sorry um, and we'll be going outside more and like and getting to sing more in the um, outside I know I had it also um, quarter two and we just kind of were inside the whole time doing notes because you can't really socially distance sing outside or sing inside um, especially with the masks on so I think We'll start going outside a lot more and getting to you know dive more into the arts then yeah i think i, I would just uh <laughs> piggyback on that and say yes they are absolutely going to ramp up uh some of the, because they can because it, it it was limiting and the our arts department is second to none they're wonderful they do a great job but it, it, we shared the burden of some restricting factors just with our you know with, with covid there so um, yes, you can expect more outside work and uh, a ramping up as we have a little bit more knowledge about what we can do with singing and instrument playing and all that. That's great. Um, I did want to make any other questions. I'm sorry, uh, Chair McClellan. I don't see any so much, Jenna, as always. Yeah, Jenna, you do great updates. I one further update. I uh, was asked by. Uh, National Honor Society uh, member Dana Mahoney to um, to put a little plug in for the National Honor Society monetary food drive for the Cohasset Food Pantry. Wonderful cause. I will be putting this in my newsletter, but um, the drive has started. It started on Monday. It will go through the 16th, which is the day before we go on to break. And donations are being accepted through Venmo at uh, at Friends of Cohasset football. And I know that uh, Coach of Fantasy, as he always does, uh, is one of the leading uh, forces in this and the students do wonderful work each year. So if anybody wants to donate via Venmo at Friends of Cohasset football, please do. And you'll see that notice in my newsletter as well. Well, thank you, Jenna. I'll let you go because I know you probably have a million things to do, but um, thank, you. thank you for the great student voice and all the work you do. Thank you. Great, great job, Jenna. Thank you. Thank you. Our wonderful by Jenna. Um, so if I can move on there, Chair McCullen, I'll move to our first uh, presentation. Absolutely. So I'm really happy to have Nicole Balashi and I believe it's Laurel Pierce Pearson. Did I get that right? Okay. I'll let Nicole will obviously introduce who, who Laurel is. Um, but I just want to publicly thank Nicole and Laurel for the work that Safe Harbors does for all the students in Cohasset. And the collaboration with Cohasset Schools is really strong um, and so appreciated. Uh, we're, it's really one of the beacons of light in this community. And um, you know, thank you, Nicole, for all your work. So you know, Nicole has a presentation. Nicole, I'm going to make you a co-host. Sure. And that way you can present. But I also have 
if you can't have any trouble, I can probably call up on the screen your presentation. No, nope, no trouble at all. <laughs> I, no, I leave it up to the phone. All my tabs. All right. Um, if it goes into present mode. Can you still see it? Yes. All right, beautiful. So thank you for the introduction, Pat. Um, and I echo your appreciation um, that you have for us, for the schools and the community, because it certainly takes a village and that sounds super cliche, but it's true. Um, so thank you, school committee. I have a lot that I'm gonna cover and hopefully um, get it out within 15 minutes and then answer any questions. Um, it, so thank you for inviting Laurie. So it's Laurel Pearson, but we call her Laurie. Um, and we are so excited to have her on board. She's our new project coordinator. Um, so this evening, I'm gonna speak about a little bit about what, who we are, what we do and what we've been up to for the past 12 months um, in the community and then specifically to the school. So for those um, who may not be familiar, Safe Harbor is a community substance use prevention coalition. And our driving mission is to continue to foster a strong and inclusive community that encourages healthy, responsible choices when it comes to drug and alcohol use. Um, and then in doing so, we aim to reduce and prevent underage substance use and adulthood addiction. Um, we are solely here, there's a common misconception. So we're solely here strictly to provide knowledge to all and then provide youth with skills to refuse until they are of legal age or delay delay until um, they are at that point. And then encourage those who are of legal age to just simply do so responsibly, set a good example, and then provide the skills to have open, honest communication with their children about their expectations when it comes to um, drug and alcohol use. So what have we accomplished in the past 12 months or so? Um, being federally funded by the Drug Free, drug -free Communities Grant, um, the grant that funds both of our positions, I'm in here with Laurie, I'm just behind the door. Um, it, it really, and, and this grant actually expires fully next September. So that's something that we are aware of and, and looking towards sustainability. Um, but we have two main goals that shape all of the work that we do throughout the year. And goal one is to increase and strengthen community collaboration. Um, and so even during the pandemic, the communication and connectedness that we were able to maintain um, really strengthened and, and built upon our partnerships across the board. Um, we continued and continued to hold coalition meetings virtually, knowing that this work needs to continue specifically during a time such as this. And during these meetings of brainstorming, we were able to have connections and um, had the opportunity to make partnerships with organizations that um, we didn't necessarily have the opportunity to have at the table previously. Um, and here you can see some of the ways that we've used communication. These are communication methods and how many uh, community members we have reached. Um, when it comes to the coalition, um, another common misconception is that the program director and the project coordinator are the coalition, uh, but we, we just do the day-to-day -day coordination and collaboration, but we are not the coalition. The coalition is made up of all 12 sectors of the Cohasset community with the same mission. And this includes the school department, the police department, youth, faith-based faith -based organizations, um, parents, et cetera. And it, truly takes a village, as I mentioned, and we're so fortunate to have Cohasset Village behind us and on board every step of the way. Um, all the efforts are steered by our 10 member steering committee, and we are looking to expand, um, adding two more members, it's only youth, one 10th grader, one 11th grader, onto the steering committee to, to really have the youth voice shine. Um, and then we have smaller working groups, like a data subcommittee, um, and parent subcommittees that really come together to talk about what they need and, and what they're seeing. And then we have our youth. So of course, our greatest working group is the youth arm of the coalition, 
also known as Youth Ambassadors. Um, and the ambassadors continued, I give all kudos to them, they continued to meet virtually from the start of the pandemic from March 17th through June 2nd, broke for summer and came back stronger in September. And they continue to meet every week, Thursdays, 4.30 to 6. Um, and they have increased. We started, you can see here, seven members in 2018, and we have 50 registered ambassadors for 2021. Um, and as Jenna mentioned, we're so excited to finally a little over a year come back in person starting after April break. So we'll get a few weeks together before we break for summer. And then here just, well, they're led by our four, our, we have four youth leaders and two in training. And then these are just a few quotes from um, current and previous youth ambassadors speaking about, it looks a little blurry on my end, but speaking about how the program has either help them or, or how um, they see it as a benefit for them and their peers. And then goal two is to reduce youth substance use within the community. Um, the most recent collection of data occurred in April, 2019 and will occur again this spring. The school administers the wellness survey every two years. Um, but when, comparison, when comparing 2017 to 2019 data, we have seen a decrease in the three main topics um, when it comes to alcohol, marijuana, and prescription drug use in the past 30 days. Um, although this is super positive and we have positive impacts, we are well aware um, from the data and anecdotally that we still have issues that we need to address when it comes to um, binge drinking, uh, parental approval, drug driving, and mental health being the biggest one. Um, so Safe Harbor continues to be committed um, in addressing those throughout the year and beyond. And always we are welcoming input and suggestions and soundwide participation because that's how we'll make the biggest impact. So what have we done in the past 12 months to target the substance use when it comes to youth? Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, but prior to the shutdown in March, we were able to hold in-person meetings, um, both coalition and ambassadors have ground level cafes, which is all our alternative Friday night evenings um, that we hold once a month. Um, and then after the shutdown, as I mentioned, we continue to hold those open coalition meetings and um, we're able to work with the police department and increase some patrol in our high risk underage drinking areas and also um, address IDing issues that occurred during the peak of the, the pandemic. Um, and then when it comes to the ambassadors, they honestly were our saving grace. They continued on um, with all the coalition goals and they took the stage in January at the Osgood and did a presentation for pre-K through two and the core learning points of that presentation were someone else's medicine might be bad for you. Um, never give yourself medicine. And if you find medicine, tell an adult. Um, and then as we met virtually, they had two main focuses in the spring. And that was to prevent underage substance use um, during COVID and to provide resources for their peers if they were struggling mentally or otherwise. So they began with social distancing. Some of you may have seen it, social distancing and mental health campaign in PSAs. And that just provided healthy coping skills, um, leaving encouraging words on rocks at Aaron River Reservoir, um, mainly because Aaron River Reservoir is an identified hotspot for risky behavior and an area that they plan to tackle um, during this year's Earth Day cleanup. Um, they completed various trainings and campaigns, one regarding the new no menthol um, in Massachusetts law that went into effect in June of 2020. And then they also provided vaping cessation tips for their peers and that went out into uh, various administration newsletters, which we're super grateful for. Um, and then this year they have um, focused all their work on themes leading up to National Prevention Week, which takes place May 9th through the 15th. Um, so they started with mental health in October and kicked off every meeting 
with an Our Minds Matter activity, which really focuses on mental health and having open conversations. And Evelyn Dickey, who is a junior, really spearheaded that initiative um, and brings Our Minds Matter activities once a month, regardless. Um, they created and disseminated a sticker for all K through 12 students with the interface referral service information. So they created the whole design, got the sticker produced, and then uh, disseminated it out to all students within the, the district, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, and then they came up with the community-wide pumpkin contest that we saw in October, as they really wanted to focus on increasing community connectedness during an isolated time while also providing prevention resources. Um, and then in November, December, they focused on alcohol use and developed stickers and did sticker shocks at Curtis Liquors, um, created a red flag resource for parents with college students coming home, um, signs to look for where it's kind of that fine line of, is it normal quote unquote um, college drinking or is this a time for some type of intervention to occur? And then they're working with uh, Steve Rotundi and a few of the teachers um, at the high school to, to bring an athlete committed code of conduct. They're, it's in the works and they're looking to implement that to really hold um, the athlete student body accountable and, and be role models because they're really the leadership um, or not the leadership, but that the part of the school that a lot of the students look up to. Um, so that's in the works. And then many additional accomplishments throughout the year included um, the ability to offer successful drug-free alternative events for youth and families. And that included the Cars Under the Stars that we um, were able to host at the high school last July, um, Grand Level Cafe at Sandy Beach. We had the community-wide pumpkin contest, as I mentioned, and then an in-person overdose awareness vigil that we host annually. Um, a few virtual parent and caregiver trainings when it came to quarantine and pandemic parenting. Um, and then our, we, we launched our our safe, camp, our safe Homes campaign, which I can get into a little bit down the road. Um, so what have we been doing school specifically? Um, in 2020, we sponsored the mental health support modules which are still up on our website. This is free to every Cohasset student and is just an additional resource. They're really interactive. We've gotten phenomenal feedback. Um, and it's just to address any type of mental health that they're feeling, whether it's stress, anxiety, um, kind of feeling disconnected when it comes to sports, et cetera. And I know Ron Ford really implemented this into his curriculum with the freshman wellness, which was great to see. And we're actually the, um, the only community that had a, a lot of youth involvement, which was nice to hear um, when we got some data back. We sponsored the new student drawstring bags that went to all freshman students and new students. And we had the opportunity to stuff that with some of our prevention resources for the students. Um, you know that we, we provided a video for the open, ho open house, virtual open houses this year. Um, we are working with Tara Noyes for National Prevention Week and there are going to be five different bulletin boards throughout the school, the high school, um, that focus on the themes of National Prevention Week. So we have alcohol prevention, marijuana prevention, prescription drug use intervention, uh, prevention, um, suicide prevention, and I know I'm missing one, but it'll come back to me. Um, so all five themes in those students are creating interactive bulletin boards that will be up all throughout National Prevention Week and a little bit afterwards. And they'll provide resources as well for those. So if there's vaping, for instance, if, if there's a student that looks at the bulletin board and feels like maybe they need some resources on quitting or for their peers, um, there will be some resources there right at the board for students to take. Um, and then we have, we're constantly working with freshman wellness to have presentations and, and work on curriculum. Um, we were actually, we had the opportunity to meet as a group with the health department um, and we had a great conversation. This was a few months back now um, to talk about the current health curriculum and, and 
look at some opportunities for expansion. And the key takeaway was consistency in getting the same message and information out to the students and parents at all grade levels. Um, and then other opportunities we saw were emphasizing role modeling and importance of that throughout across the board K through 12, but specifically grade five, just because that's ahead of the curve and really going upstream. Um, and then Patty Hamlin has been phenomenal. So we realized that alcohol wasn't really introduced until middle school, alcohol prevention materials. So um, she took the opportunity to, to implement alcohol curriculum into the fifth grade level, um, which has been, I think feedback has been great. Um, and then just adjusting the curriculum to follow national health education standards rather, rather than the Massachusetts. It just seems to be a little more up to date than our states. Um, and then lastly, the last two things, um, the parent handbook in 2019, we were able to Safe Harbor purchase the rights to the parent handbook, which is um, a book that goes home to parents that have graduating seniors how to talk with their college students about alcohol, ways to prevent um, risky behavior once they're out of the bubble, quote unquote, of Cohasset. Um, so in 2019, we partnered with the high school and uh, mailed it out to every single family that had a graduating senior. Um, and then of course, we weren't able to do so last year just with COVID. However, Brian Scott did email it out to the entire high school. Um, which is great, broadening the audience, but we are hoping um, to go back to that physical mailing for this coming year. And we do that in July. And then lastly, we will be sponsoring um, Brain Drain for grades four through six in the spring of 2022 um, and peak performance for all athletes, um, athlete students in the fall of 2021. Um, Brain Drain is an interactive presentation that provides current research-based information on various aspects of drug abuse and addiction. So it really just talks about how the brain works um, and how certain substances affect it at a younger age level where they can comprehend it. And then Peak Performance is a one-hour interactive program that covers the impact of substances on athletic performance. And this includes caffeine and workout supplements, um, unique factors that place athletes at a greater risk for substance misuse and strategies to develop a positive team culture. I think this is super important and I'm so happy to hear that the school is implementing this in the fall, just because we have, I think the data showed that we have 85% of the high school that is involved with the sport. So I think this is very imp important information that um, We'll get to them in an interactive way. And then lastly, just some things that we have in the queue, um, school specific and community wide. We have our parent advisor. This is a resource that we've had for the past, I wanna say 18 months. Um, and I'm not sure how many people know that we have it and offer it. It's a free and confidential service offered to all Cohasset residents. Um, you may either have a family member or a friend or they're personally struggling who would like to talk to someone um, who has gone through this before rather than calling a number on the back of an insurance card. This is more intimate. Um, Anne-Marie can meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, whatever they prefer. Um, but Anne-Marie has 10 years plus of experience navigating the often um, complicated world of addiction. So all the information to contact her is on safeharborcohasset.org under the programs tab. Um, it's just a great resource that we're able to provide. Um, and then we have our open coalition meetings, the last two of the year. One is tomorrow morning, just a little plug, um, tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. And then the last one is June 3rd. And those are opportunities, great opportunities for parents and community members alike to just come hear what we're doing, what's in the queue um, and share input. What can we be doing better? What are we missing? is oftentimes we get tunnel vision. So um, we always welcome new perspectives. We have the spring into action that the youth ambassadors have put into place. Um, this is where they're, the whole goal of spring into action was to just spread community cheer through delivering a plant. Um, 
and all the proceeds go back to the youth ambassadors. So tonight is the last night to order plants. And they're up to the last time we checked 92 plants that were ordered throughout the, the community, which is awesome. Um, we'll be at Earth Day, Drug Take Back Day on April 24th, giving out the Terra. Um, we have another ground level cafe at Sandy Beach on May 7th. And that is, we have to limit the number of people. So um, those spots are filling up. So if there are youth that want to attend, we highly recommend that they registered ahead of time. Um, and then the last one I just wanted to mention is the Wellness Wednesday emails. We partnered with PSO. Um, in the past, we've had guiding good choices in person and um, the pandemic has really limited the way that we can do that. So the PSO starting April 28th will have six weeks every Wednesday information that comes from guiding good choices out to the parent population just ways and skills that have open communication with um, their children, some uncomfortable topics, how to navigate through it. Um, and we're really excited to, to see that kind of flourish and unfold. Um, and then, yeah, we're just ramping up for, for the next year. Um, year four youth ambassadors will start in September. So we're already planning ahead. And then lastly, if you want more information, um, lend us your lawn. We are always looking for a lawn for our lawn signs um, for National Prevention Week and our Safe Homes campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And as you can see how multi-layered and multifaceted the uh, work is and how youth involved the work is, which is just wonderful. And obviously you can see a lot of collaboration throughout this too. So um, again, I just want to reiterate my thanks to Nicole and to your organization for the work you do. I don't know if the school committee had any questions for Nicole. Um, clearly there's a lot, lot to digest there, but that's a good thing because it means there's a lot happening. Mrs. Scalera, do you have any questions? I would like to say a few things. First, how incredibly fortunate I think we are to have you in our town, Nicole. And I'm sure Laura will feel the same about you. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and I just can't, I can't believe how, how amazing your work is and transformative really. We can see the results. You've clearly laid them out. They're tied to data. I think the work that you do is phenomenal and I wanna thank you for it. Um, I am very interested to see, it's like, it's like, is it a good thing or a bad thing that we're gathering data on the heels of a pandemic, right? Because it's definitely gonna skew, you know, I, I know for, for grownups, this has not been, uh, has not been uh, a deterrent for substance use. <laughs> so I imagine that the data will be slightly skewed, um, but I'm really interested to see what it is. So I'm glad that you're gathering it. Thank you for doing all of that work. I want to say that I was at the Samantha Skunk presentation and that is like one of my very favorite things that you guys have done because I really, really believe. And you know, I was excited to hear you talk about um, alcohol education going into the fifth grade because I think the earlier we can explain to our littles the the more they will just sort of grow up with a different understanding of, uh, and a perspective on this issue, right? So I, I really think that Samantha Skunk was awesome because the big kids taught the little kids, right? And so there was a lot in it for both of them. Um, the one question I have, which is probably a silly one because there's, there's probably an uh, obvious answer, but the, uh, the programming that you talked about for student athletes, that seems great. I really am excited that that's happening. I was wondering if there's a, a parental component to that specifically, or if it's just sort of whether the parents will get information about that. Um, in re regards to the peak performance? Yeah. Um, I don't know specifically, and, and Leslie, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it is, I, I would assume that information would go out to the parents to give them a heads up that this is occurring, but I don't know if there is a parent component like there is with Drug Story Theater yeah. where there can be a QA. and a Yeah, the, um, that's a good question. There is a, there is a component for parents for all of them for the dream. Um, 
um, brain drain. And for, I do, you know, I can go back and look at my notes to see, but it's pretty comprehensive through um, Karen and they do a nice job. So, um, because the parent, the parent component is really huge. Yeah, Karen, yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, there probably is something. Yeah, yeah, they've been doing this for a long time. And um, the, the education of parents is just as important as the education of the students, right? Because they're- Yeah, gonna- I think sometimes parents, uh, understandably, because it's, totally like socially acceptable behavior right like I think sometimes they don't necessarily understand that because their children's brains are still developing that it has a profound impact and and I think that maybe just sometimes that surprises people so right thank you so much thank Thank you thank you we appreciate it thank you Mr. Cleary Mr. Kearney Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nicole, and your, and your staff. And I'm one of the lucky parents that um, have three, uh, we, we have three of our children in the program. And uh, it is one of the best things that we've ever done. And, uh, and you talk about the last uh, year, you guys were fantastic, stepped up, um, put, kids were all in different rooms talking, and, and, and they were communicating and getting the message out there. And Uh, You know, I'm living the dream with you guys. And I I would just say to people, uh, folks out there that sign your children up for this. Um, And it was the best thing that I ever did. I mean, and uh, we're just wreaking the benefits now because to to, to Ashley's point um, about like educating, you know, why it's important that kids don't drink because their brain's still developing. And to to hear you guys say it, it's such a uh, different thing from me saying because we're fortunate now as parents to have the internet to say hey look it up right mm-hmm. I mean junk food's bad for you look it up like dad's not so dopey right I mean <laughs> that, that's the good news and you guys just reinforce that and I gotta I gotta give you credit because it makes parenting so much easier because these are times that the, the kids are gonna that need you the most. I mean, right? They they they're going through some tough times, especially through a pandemic, and to have that resources, I I, I just was blessed, and I'm so grateful. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. We're lucky to have the three of them. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kearney, Mrs. Marr. Do you have any comments or questions? Uh, just a, a brief comment, Nicole. Thank you so much. Uh, for all the work you and your team do. And I'd really like to comment to parents who are listening or watching to say that there are resources in this town. And I think if anything, the last 15 months have shown us is that life can turn on a dime. Um, And what we know as normal is no longer normal. And there's no reason to deal with stress or anxiety about the curves, you know, the curveballs that life throws us alone and they, you know, coupled with the resources that the school provides to parents when we have these kind of crises and the work that you and your group do and the resources you provide, uh, I would encourage every parent to take advantage, advantage of it. There's no reason to feel anxious or, 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 or not know how to help your child if your child is feeling anxious. And I think that's one of the best components of your program is, is the resources available. And so um, I encourage parents to, to reach out. They need support um, and, and tackle their issues head on. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And if there are any parents out there that are looking for more information about anything that I mentioned, we put everything on our website. So safeharborcohasset.org, every resource for parents, teens, community members alike, it's all on there. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mar, Mr. St. Ange. I just want to add to the compliments. I'm just, I'm just so <laughs> impressed by what you're doing. I know I get so many great reports when my kids don't come home and they're, um, they're still little, they're seven and nine, but like, like Ashley said, when that Samantha the Skunk presentation was happening at school, that is all we were talking about after school. And just so, such a nice conversation starter or conversation continuation. And I'm just so impressed by the how student driven it is going from seven student ambassadors to 50 in such a short time is just so amazing to have that um, just 
buy-in and, and leadership among our kids is just really great to see. So thank you for, for everything that you're doing to help, to help them do that and to help our community. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. And we hope to have Samantha Skunk be annual. Um, obviously last year was a little bit of a, we couldn't do it in person or we did do it in person in January, just not this January. So maybe next. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Balaji, for that wonderful presentation. Um, the Safe Harbor, Harbor Coalition is obviously an indispensable resource and an absolute boon to our community. So thank you so much for making the time uh, to present all that information uh, to us uh, all here tonight and uh, for all the work that you continue to do for Cohasset. Absolutely. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, thank you Lord. So, um, moving on, Dr. Sullivan. I will. Uh, before I move on to our, some discussions about our uh, soft Deer Hill softball field and the turf and the track, I just want to mention, you know, in the theme of April or March is the, the new September. One of the things that Dr. Scollins and I had planned on doing if the pandemic wasn't here in September uh, was to, uh, in, in an effort to try to get more understanding of student experience, was to actually ride on the Metco bus. Um, into Boston when we picked up the students and ride back. Well, we're doing that tomorrow. So tomorrow morning, Dr. Scones and I are venturing into to Boston um, on our elementary Metco bus. Very excited to see the students and the, the families who are will be at those bus stops and really want to try to gain a, a better understanding of you know what that's like for our, our students, um, which will hopefully help as we, we look to make their experiences as good as possible. So I just wanted to share that with the committee. I almost forgot it. It's gonna be definitely an interesting and exciting experience tomorrow to be with those amazing kids. So it'd be great. Um, <clears throat> so can I move on, Chair McClellan? Yes, sir, please do. Wonderful. So moving on, uh, I'm gonna promote, if it's okay with you, uh, if we take the, the Deer Hill field first, uh, um, promote, I believe it's Mr. Andy Sims, Mr. Uh, Sims and Mr. Mark Chase are both the presenters for this item. Okay, I will just take a moment and promote them as well as um, Athletic Director Rotundi. So just bear with me. Uh, okay. Oh, yep. All right. So Mr. Sims is in. And what was the other name? Uh, Mark Chase. Okay. Oop, moved on my screen here. Okay, Mr. Chase and Mr. Sims are coming in and just going to promote um, Athletic Director Rotundi. I should say that Athletic Director Rotundi does have a group out on the field. So if for some reason he's not able to join in, he did say it makes sure he came back and uh, would answer any questions. I knew the timing was going to be tricky on this with him. Um, but they would welcome Mr. Sims and Mr. Chase. Uh, I'll leave it to Chair McClellan to, to, to carry on with this particular item. Sure. So, uh, uh, is it requested that this uh, be added to the agenda uh, once we were through uh, the thick of it with getting the kids returned to their buildings? And um, I, I don't know that we're ever going to be through the thick of it until the academic year ends, but at least they're back in the building. So at this point, um, we're looking forward to hearing about Mr. Sims and, uh, uh, excuse me, hearing from Mr. Sims about his, uh, his project or his proposed projects concerning the Deer Hill softball field. Mr. Sims. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, you know, you know, school committee members, thank you very much for having uh, having us in here to the meeting tonight. Really appreciate it and uh, taking the time to consider this. Um, I'm here uh, you know, representing uh, CYBSA, which uh, that stands for Cohasset Youth Baseball and Softball Association. Uh, I'm an officer of the board for the organization. I'm the director of youth softball. I also have with me tonight uh, uh, Mark Chase, who is the president of the board for CYBSA, and he's here to um, help me field uh, any uh, complex questions, particularly around the funding, uh, CPC or otherwise. Um, so as it says on the agenda, we're here to discuss uh, at the Deer Hill softball field. It's that field in the corner of the Deer Hill complex uh, and ultimately make a request to renovate the field. Mr. Sims, I don't interrupt you, but if you did want to present anything, I did make you a co-host. Oh, so fantastic. Are, I've got something, yes, here, I'll do the screen. Yep. Do it. 
So I had a feeling you were reading up. Uh, I've been there, so I wanted to make sure. I've got, I've got about a whole more, <laughs> got <Okay>. some notes. <laughs> let me see. I let me make sure. I, okay. Yeah. There you go. Here we go. Can everyone? Hopefully, everyone can see that. Okay. We can see it well. Okay. Terrific. Okay. There's just really a couple of slides to show here. I'd rather uh, talk through it than than have too much text up on the screen. Um, so this is a this is a great slide that uh, that basically shows the project uh, uh, visual of it. Um, and so really, in, uh, and I will try to keep this brief. This could I know this could go on for I mean I could talk about this for days probably, but. Uh, basically, uh, the softball program at CYBSA has been growing uh, steadily since 2015. We've reached a record enrollment this year of uh, around 110 or 115 uh, uh, girls from grades K through eight. Uh, and we play and use the softball field over across from Wheelwright Park on North Main Street. Uh, that's also the home field for the varsity softball program, which, uh, which is a co-op uh, softball program with Hull High School. Uh, so really what I've got over there on Freedom Field is K through 12 softball. Um, and now uh, it's reached the point where over the last couple of years, I've been uh, having to borrow fields uh, from the surrounding towns. They've been very gracious. It's never been a problem, um, but it's a precarious position to be in, uh, to say the least. Uh, so in, with, with that in mind, we started looking to try to source uh, an additional playing surface for the, uh, for the softball program. And um, <clears throat> after considering a, you know, several options around town, uh, the uh, softball field in the corner of Deer Hill was really the best option. It has great um, infrastructure already, the, the backstop, the side fence, completely fine. It was really well installed. It was put in in the 2003-2004 um, <clears throat> middle and high school and Deer Hill renovation project. Uh, and uh, we're going to, we would like to please update it, pull out the clay infield and put in a really uh, low maintenance, you know, high drainage stone dust uh, for an infield there. Uh, no changes to the outfield. So the scope of the project is limited to the, to the infield of that softball field. It's got six, it's a six inches of solid clay infield, but to bring it up to standards for current day elementary school, uh, we need to put stone dust in. Um, this will make it really an all season, all weather type of field and with a very far reaching benefit uh, for playing at recess, kickball games, physical education, uh, uh, physical education classes, as well as field day. Um, and then also, uh, to provide an additional playing space for the softball program. The primary uh, age group that would be using this would be the uh, really the Deer Hill age group of grades three through five and also the Osgoods uh, K through two. That's how our program is set up into those age groups. Um, <clears throat> this uh, was one quick thing here. If you can see my cursor, this area right here uh, is there's going to be, you can see the sideline of the painted sports field here. In this case, it's at lacrosse, but it can also be the field hockey field. My youngest daughter plays field hockey, so I'm familiar with that, with the, the dimensions here and, the, and the, um, what they use the space for. In this area, is, there's a 17-foot grass buffer between the outermost part, part of this stone dust infield and this um, painted sideline of the uh, other sports field. Uh, so 17 feet of grass will be there. Uh, the construction, the vehicles and excavation equipment will be using the paved uh, roads throughout the area coming right around here uh, through over to Osgood. And this is in using this access path. It's more like a road. It's, it's about 20 feet wide and it can easily uh, handle the um, construction vehicles that will be coming through there. There'll be absolutely no uh, movement across here uh, in this open grass area of construction vehicles, no interference at all. It's all back through this path behind the home plate and working in this infield area in and out of this 
area right here. <clears throat> so that's the that's basically uh, the pro the logistics of it in a nutshell. Plus a couple put in the two aluminum benches, and we're good to go. Um, the basically the, I'm going to try to advance the slide here. Basically the vision here is uh, an elementary school in Marshfield, Massachusetts that uses this same model and they have a large, pretty large campus there, but um, let me scroll this up here. They have several of these fields in the, in, on their, on their uh, elementary school grounds. And um, <clears throat> this is basically the prototype of what we want it to, to look like when it's finished. Just a stone dust infield in an open grass area. This is a multi-use uh, area for uh, GWS in Marshfield with other sports sharing the outfield, so on and so forth. Um, so that brings me to go over the specifics. I just want to make two while I while I have the uh, floor here. I just want to articulate the two requests that we that CYBSA is making um, of the school committee. And then I, I'm happy to field questions and you know go on, so on and so forth. So basically the the, the first request is to that we're making is uh, we're requesting requesting permission to please renovate the infield of the Deer Hill softball field. And we're not requesting funding from the school district for that. We do have a CPC application in, progr in progress um, and or otherwise fundraising. Um, the net, and then the second request is related to uh, facilities use fees. And uh, to, I wanna make sure I'm reading this to make sure I get it correct. If, if CYBSA receives a CPC grant to cover the entire cost of the Deer Hill project, then we simply request that we pay the same fees as the other sports programs that use the facility. And then, uh, but if CYBSA pays for all or part of the project on our own through fundraising, then we please request a fee waiver for using the facility after making the effort and the investment. Um, there's one adjustment to, to the timeline I wanted to, to make also, uh, and it has to do with you know, my own learning curve on um, basically town government affairs and uh, CPC application process. Uh, but, but basically, um, you know, due to the CPC funding timing, uh, if, we receive, if, we, if we do end up receiving a grant, the earliest we could really receive the check and begin renovation work would be July 1st, 2021. Uh, so additionally, regardless of the CPC grant, contractor availability has us pushed out until mid or late June anyway. And uh, based on, you know, based on those logistical details, the project won't be underway for this spring. One other uh, one other note that I wanted to say here, uh, and then I can, I'll be happy to field questions. Um, and thank you so much for allowing me this much time, uh, is that I have been, you know, I have, I have had a discussion with other sports programs that uh, use that, um, this, the Deer Hill facility, because uh, there's several private sports programs that use the space. And I've, I have had a discussion with Cohasset Youth Lacrosse, uh, regarding the field scheduling needs um, <clears throat> because uh, there is specific timing where evening softball games uh, would be in the springtime would be at the same time as that Cohasset Youth Lacrosse uses the field. So we're working together on that. And, uh, and I wanted to just and put that out there that you know we're not ever having the intention to bump anyone from the facility. We just want, we wanna to work together and you know, for softball, it's just baby steps. Um, we would love to just get a basic uh, field set up to uh, play a couple games a week. Um, and you know, this fall is field hockey season, 
and I'm looking forward to working with field hockey in the same regard. My daughter is plays field hockey and loves it. Uh, and, <clears throat> and, um, I'll be in touch with them also. <clears throat> so thank you very much. Uh, if I'm, I'm happy to field questions now, that was the, that was the high level, but those were the things I really wanted to cover. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Sims. Um, for your presentation. Um, at this point, I know that um, there's um, there are some anxious members of the community um, uh, ready to ask questions here. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, I would ask the committee uh, to consider whether or not we can open it up um, as we sometimes do to community um, questions first. I don't know how many there are, but I know that someone's been very anxious about it. So um, it's up to the committee though. So if, there, if there's a motion um, to the effect of, of uh, allowing us to go to community questions first. I'm certainly willing to entertain that. Is there such a motion on the floor? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Kearney. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Yeah. All in favor? Mrs. Caleri? Aye. Mr. Kearney? Aye. Mrs. Marr? No. Um, Mrs. St. Ange? Aye. Craig McClellan? Aye. That motion passes. So we will go to community questions. Um, the question is from uh, Mr. Russell, Russell Bonetti. Um, he asked, he does not note his address um, for the minutes, but he asks how long is the waiver for fees? Should CYBSA pay part of the project? How much is considered part? So, Mr. Sims, I don't know if I should be directing these questions to you or uh, Mr. Chase, as you mentioned, he, he might be there for some support there. I don't know who wants to answer, answer that question. And Mr. Benetti just chimed in with his address, which is 20 Parker Avenue. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I appreciate that. And uh, Mark, if, if you'd like to uh, comment on that, I would, I would really appreciate that. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Mark Chase, uh, this is, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, this is Mark. Yeah, you got you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've been to the CPC. It's, it's a, I, I understand Russ's question. He is concerned about that. Um, you know, nobody has discussed, uh, what portion, uh, how much we would have to pay in order to request the, the user fee waiver, but I don't think that's an issue because if it is an issue, we just won't ask for one. Um, and I, I don't believe that's a, a stopper from the point of view of CYBSA. Uh, but we have been to CPC. We, we had a vote uh, at the CPC meeting. They voted to fund this project 100%. And um, the, uh, it was uh, the, the, whole, the whole project was uh, tabled, not tabled, but it was uh, postponed a little bit because I think uh, of some of some of the questions that may be coming up now. I think um, there were some reservations that maybe all of the information wasn't uh, available to the CPC members uh, at the time that they voted. So maybe we can answer some of those. But as far as uh, uh, as far as at what point, uh, if CYBSA had to make an investment, whether it's 25%, 50%, 75%, 10%, uh, at what point uh, would we have to, would we expect to be able to get the waiver? I would say that if there's an objection to it by the town, then we won't even ask for a waiver, even if it's w whatever the portion is. That, that's, that's I'm, I'm speaking for myself and I think Andy probably would agree with that. I, I don't think we want that to stop the project. I agree, yes. Do you agree with that? Okay. Absolutely, <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, well, Mr. Benetti followed up by, by indicating they agreed to 19,000 and overruns would be outside their vote. Okay. Just it's a comment and I'm reading it and uh, yep. for your edification. So uh, I don't see any other comments. We're gonna move on to the school committee uh, comments at this point. Mrs. Cleary, do you have any comments? Um, yes, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I wonder if there has been consideration to rec camp schedule. I'm not opposed to any part of this project. I think it seems like if you all are going to be making an investment in 
uh, the field, that would be lovely. I just do want to make sure that we're being considerate scheduling wise. I'm sure you would be anyway, but the date did sort of, uh, resonate with me as when maybe rec camp might be using the fields. Have you talked to Ted Carroll at all or anyone on rec? Uh, no, we haven't talked. We haven't spoken to uh, the rec department about it. Um, and really these, this is all under the category of schedule management and we're, we're very flexible and can work around it. We run softball from like March through October. So to make this project a, a win for us and a success, it, there's tons of opportunity and we can work with the scheduling. Um, okay. Ashley, it, it, yeah. it is possible, sorry to interrupt, but it is possible that um, Athletic Director Rotunda who's on this call might have a little bit more information about that just from uh, okay. past experience. I don't know, Steve, if you have any info about that particular uh, scheduling issue, you can chime in. Yeah, I think um, everyone got me okay. Hi, Steve. Um, hi. I think uh, in terms of the, the recreation, yeah, I think some uh, schedule coordination would need to be done um, around that. But from my conversations with Andy and looking at the timeline of the project, um, it's really confined to that small area and I, it's, it's can be completed in a fairly short amount of time. So um, I, I think that conversation definitely needs to, to happen. But I think with um, the amount of time that it would take up to start and complete the project is absolutely doable to you know, meet everyone's needs. Okay, so, so for me, it just seems like, thank you, Steve. It, it seems like um, there's just a lot of, I don't know where the sort of like central place is for scheduling and group uses. And uh, does that rest with us or does it that does. rest with rec it, or? No, it, it rests with the schools. Okay. We, we're the ones who determine uh, and approve uh, facilities use. Um, and then, of course, the committee is the one uh, in terms of um, structure, fee structure. It really is the committee's purview for that. But okay. in terms of who uses the fields and when they use it, it really all has to go through the schools. And I think everyone here understands that. Um, but just to answer your question. So then to clarify, we're just meant to decide whether or not we are okay with this project happening and any potential, which there don't seem to be any budgetary implications. And then you all are responsible for making sure it's scheduled in a way, like the administration would make sure it's scheduled in a way that's not disruptive to any of the groups that need it. Absolutely. And okay. all of that goes through our um, business office here through Sue Owen and, um, and her team to make those determinations. And of course, with consultation from Steve for you know, a variety of reasons regarding athletics. But no, that, that wouldn't change. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Kaliri. Mr. Kieran, do you have any questions for Mr. Sims or Ms. Chase? Oh, absolutely. First of all, I'd like to thank you guys for coming in. Um, fantastic presentation. I know you guys have spent a lot of time on this. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am for this project. Uh, as a father of two amazing softball players, uh, and they and and it's like you just said, Andy said, uh, 110 uh, girls signing up for softball. That that is unbelievable. And to, I, you know, I'm in it. I've been coaching my girls since since uh, they were in fourth grade, and uh, going through the program and watching it develop, and watching uh, the girls just come together and and form a team and the friendships and I just can't tell you how excited I am for the kids at Cohasset and, uh, and, the, and them to be able to uh, again play a sport. Today I dropped my girls off they have practice they have 20 something girls on the varsity softball team. I mean that just speaks volumes of why this is needed because now they can have the opportunity to uh, have another field would be just it's so good for the kids so Thank you again, and uh, I, I, I'm totally in favor of this project. Thank you, Mr. Kearney. Thank, Mrs. You. Thank you. Yes, hi. Th um, thank you, Mr. Sims, Mr. Chase, uh, for the presentation. 
Uh, Mark, it's good to see you. It's been a long time. Good to see you, Ellen. <laughs> I know. Mark, Mark and I go way, way, way back um, in sports. He knows uh, how involved I've been over the years. Mm -hmm. Our kids are pretty much the same age and have overlapped. Um, so I, I think this is terrific. I, I think it, it's a, a great use of a dormant space and where space is such a premium in this town. Um, I am uh, an athletic supporter in every way, shape and form and to get kids out engaged um, in sports um, does so much for them in terms of their development uh, in leadership, teamwork, um, uh, re reliability, dependability. So I, I, think it's, I think it's a terrific, terrific project. I do have a couple of questions. Uh, I'd like to dovetail off what Mrs. Colieri said about rec camp. So if we find that the project construction is overlapping at some point, would there be any construction fence, fencing uh, put in uh, to protect or deter activity towards that infield area? Yeah, absolutely. We, we could do that. If, if there's active camp going on uh, out there, you know, outside of Deer Hill and in that field area while they're working on the infield, we'll definitely have them put up a, a safety barrier, construction fence to, to, to mark that off. Okay, that, that would be great because there's also a lot of unstructured use of, of the fields. We, we see it at, on every campus, you know, where kids will go down with a lacrosse ball or you, you know, right. a soccer ball and, and just play on their own as kids do, you know, which is what we want them to do. So I think some kind of visual deterrent that, that's also safety driven would be important. The other question also relates to that in terms of if this project is going on during recreation camp and you indicated that, um, you know, the, the trucks, I, I happened to ask Mr. Bonetti for a copy of the presentation and there's, um, you know, truck loads of uh, old infield to remove and truck loads of new infield uh, to put back in. And again, it's a very trafficked high volume area during rec camp. And mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if attention could be paid to the scheduling of the, the truck, um, you know, I was even just gonna suggest access from Old Pasture Road, but I don't think that's a good idea because that Osgood area is also used for camp, but that really needs to be special attention. You have kids on bike, you have kids walking, you have parents picking up and dropping off. And the last thing we need is something going on with heavy equipment um, and pedestrians. Um, my, okay. next question, yeah. my next question is about the maintenance. Um, so will the CYBSA um, allow for uh, periodic maintenance. I would imagine infill, the stone dust might have to be replenished, perhaps not in the amounts that have to go in it initially. Um, will, you know, benches be replaced if, if they're damaged? I'm just curious about that plan. Right, uh, as far as the maintenance goes, the, um, well, the, the grass area, the mowing and trimming is um, just, uh, status quo, stay the course with the DPW. And then for this, the field service, the field surface, um, and uh, that will be really um, maintained and worked on by parent volunteers of the softball program, uh, as far as raking and keeping that uh, in playable condition. Um, and then uh, the existing fencing that's there is uh, in, it's all in great shape uh, and it's been there since 2004. Um, but if per se uh, it were, that's something to actually, that's something to consider. Like if, if, if a tree fell across the backstop and, and destroyed the, the entire backstop, um, I, I would probably have to come to you guys to ask what to do next. Okay. That, that's fair. Will the backstop have to come down to allow access for the equipment? No, absolutely not. Actually, I, I, I've I've been out. I've been here with three um, three different companies getting the bids for it, and uh, this area is 
this path right here is, is quite wide and and then they can they can bring all the equipment around this side fence the first base side fence between these trees it and using a small i'm not an equipment expert but small little back hose to dig this out and load up the trucks and then take them on out okay okay um all right, so that, those are all my questions for Mr. Sims and Mr. Chase. And I, I just wanna make a comment to my, to my colleagues uh, about this project um, and about not the project itself, but about the process. It has, um, I kind of found out about this yesterday. Uh, there was a, an email sent out, um, forwarded, uh, keeping us in the loop. I didn't know what the loop was to be kept in, to be honest with you. And then I was watching the board of so the select board meeting last night with advisory and um, CPC presented their recommendations and this was on there and chairman um, Kennedy of the select board, she knew I was in the audience and she asked me if I would speak on this and, and, and I couldn't, I said, no, I, I don't, I don't know anything about this. Um, so it was, it's a little awkward and it seems a little bit, um, backwards that these presentations have been made and CPC funding has, has been approved by CPC and we're now um, being presented with it. And it's, um, you know, last year um, I spoke with Mr. Carney about he had uh, initiated something without committee, you know, um, conversation and it really isn't how we work and I, I'm just I'm just disappointed that we're at this point now and it's it's really I've learned about it in 24 hours so that's all I have to say hey thank you mrs. Marr I apologize that um, that you um, didn't know about this ahead of the select board meeting uh, last night um, obviously, as I always do, I send out the, uh, the agendas to the entire committee for a review before they're posted to ensure that any committee members that have any questions or proposed additions to the um, meeting agenda are able to voice those um, in, you know, again, uh, in the, uh, during the preceding week um, before the meeting. So that would have been at the end of last week. Um, so um, with, all, with all due respect, it was so vague. It was so vague that I didn't know what to ask. It was a very vague agenda item. Okay, well, I just, I, I mean, obviously we titled it Deer Hill Softball Field. Um, I, I don't I don't know um, how, I, 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 that's that's what it is. Um, so I, I don't know, I mean, beyond forwarding these things, I mean, I, I don't know how else to communicate every single issue. I mean, that's why I do it. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we can talk, I mean, you know, obviously offline about it. I, I, I This is exactly the reason I do that, to avoid the situation. Um, it hasn't been done in the past, frankly. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I try to give everyone an, an, an opportunity to do that. But, uh, you know, obviously that effort failed in this particular case. And for that, I apologize. And I understand that's probably an awkward situation for you to be called upon to comment something that's related to the school district. And as a school committee um, member, you're unable to do so because you weren't uh, equipped with the information. That was not something that was intentional or purposeful. I guess that was just uh, inadvertent and unfortunate circumstance. And um, I'm sorry that that happened, but I, I did take, uh, I did employ some measures to, to guard against that. And um, I didn't receive any questions or comments about it. So um, here we are, um, and I guess there's nothing we can do about it. I, I'll try and make things more explicit on the agenda moving forward. Um, and uh, perhaps work in a couple more days to give school committee members a few more days notice about agenda items and uh, opportunity to ask questions or express concern about them. Could, could I say something about that, please? This is uh, Mark Chase. Um, um, I, I'm just gonna say that it, uh, a lot of this is probably maybe our fault uh, because we're kind of novices at how you go through the system in a situation like this. So I, I don't wanna speak for Andy too much, but I know that he went through and talked to various people in the school department um, and worked his way through the through the the maze of different entities there. Um, 
but uh, you know, we didn't, we don't, I don't think we really were aware of uh, exactly what procedure. I mean, I, I know on my end, trying to go uh, to the CPC and to the advisory committee and the select board, I, I know that part of it, but going through the school system, I don't, th I think we're just doing, uh, taking one, one baby step at a time and uh, perhaps we should have been doing something else. We, it, it, it may have been our fault that we didn't notify all of the people that we should have notified. Um, so I, it, Ellen, it might be our fault rather than somebody on your board, uh, because it, perhaps if we went through the right process, if we knew what it was, uh, you would have been uh, aware of this a long time ago. But uh, well, we apologize I, for that. Can I say something? There's no reason to apologize, Mr. Chief. This is this is all, everyone on this this screen right now. All we're trying to do is better the school district. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone on here. So you know, you guys are coming up with a project. You're doing the best you can. You're trying to invest in our school district. Um, you're trying to make a positive change here. And there's no blame to be laid, you know, or placed. Um, you know, everyone's trying to do the best they can. So you know, we're talking about it. Let's 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 move on. And, um, you know, uh, Mrs. Marr's comments are duly noted and, and I, I can appreciate her position. So um, Mrs. Marr, if there's nothing further, I'll move on to Mrs. St. Ange. Okay, Mrs. St. Ange. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's great to have these visuals. I know I had received emails earlier when we were in quote, the thick of everything this winter. So it was hard to even process what was being discussed, but, um, you know, having these pictures is really helpful. One question I have, actually two questions, and maybe you mentioned it and I just missed it. What is the um, expected timeline of the actual project? Like once it begins, how long will that take to, um, to renovate the field? Andy? I did not mention that, uh, but okay. all three of the, um, all three of the companies have said they can get this done beginning to end in uh, one biz week. So like, you know, five days. Oh, okay. This is, a, this is quick. This, this is, this is like entry level stuff for them. This is, this will be easy. <laughs> that sounds very efficient. And I wish projects at my house went that quickly. Um, <laughs> also in the pathway that is labeled access for equipment, I know you're saying it's, it's wide. Is that going to be able to be used without cutting down any trees? Something that just really bothers me is trees being cut down for trucks. It just drives me nuts. So just curious how that's how that's going to be accessed. Yeah. Uh, I'm right with you. Yes, and uh, it looks actually if we, it looks like it's skinnier than it is. Um, mm -hmm. I was I've been I've been out there many times and. I uh, walked that area with the um, with the potential contractors for this, and the the trees have a higher level overhang, but the trunks it's like as wide as a, a regular road. It's like 24 feet wide or something. So these guys were like, this is they were like really happy about that access path and the roadway. It's just it's all like working in their favor to be able to get this done easily and quickly. N no cutting down trees. <laughs> Okay, that's good to hear. Just want to keep that, you know, riparian buffer zone, keep all the animals we can around here. Um, totally agree, trees. totally agree. Um, I think some of my questions have already been asked by other committee members. I think I think the, uh, it sounds from what you've presented, it sounds like a good plan. I think any time that our general community population and school population, um, and, and of course softball can benefit from the same project, it seems, Kind of like a no-brainer, um, and I, I just knowing these other details helps to to make it feel that way. So thanks for answering questions too. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mr. Saint Ange, um, Mr. Sims, and Mr. Chase. Thank you for all your efforts. I, um, um, you know, in, in general support of it. You know, so long as, it, and I think that you've made it clear that you're 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 understanding and acknowledging the fact that there's going to be some overlap in scheduling that you're going to have to work around and be sensitive to. Um, it seems like you've um, uh, adequately outlined the fact that uh, none of the uh, stone dust infield will uh, overlap with the playing surface of the other sports, which obviously would adversely affect the playability, for lack of a better phrase or, or term, um, of those particular uh, athletic activities. And, um, you know, so long as you're understanding that, you know, making this type of investment in the district's property wouldn't give you any sort of exclusive rights 
um, over the usage of that field. It's something that you're doing and will benefit the overall district property. And obviously will, um, I think, outfit the area to accommodate uh, certain sports so long as they can fit, uh, be fit in to the regular schedule and queue, so to speak, um, in, in all sensitivity um, to other sports uh, needs. Um, is that, you know, that, is that your feeling? Is that your position? You understand that? Yes. Yep. Yes, Fully we do. Understand. Mark, how about you? Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, um, I, I don't have any further comment and at this point. Um, I do just note that Mr. Bonetti um, did comment that he, I, I think he was responding to the, um, to the, some comment that was made that they had already approved this. He, he mentioned CPC does not approve, we recommend, and our recommendation may be to wait until the fall. Uh, he says the CPC is paying for this, but you'd never know it by this presentation. So those are the comments that I'm seeing from Mr. Bonetti at this time. Um, at this point, um, I am looking to the school committee for um, a motion to uh, approve the plan. Um, for, yeah, well, um, well, it's two, um, Craig, there's two motions, right? One is that to approve the plan and the other one would be to fund uh, that they don't pay the dues. Um, can we talk about that for a second? Because I, I, is that right? Like, uh, because they're putting in a $19,000 investment, you guys are looking to waive the dues, correct? So, so Mr. Kearney, just, just hold that thought for one second. So I said, Dr. Sullivan just put his hand up and I just want to know what, what he's asking before we discuss this topic. Okay. He, he, oh, thank you, uh, Chair McClellan. I, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Paul, but I, I just wanted to see um, for the committee's um, knowledge if, uh, if Athletic Director Rotundi or Sue Owen had any concerns or any anything they they might want to add because just I just want the committee to have a full picture. Uh, I'm not even saying they do. I just wanted want to offer them that if you're amenable to it. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Sullivan. I completely forgot. That's the whole reason why we moved it up in the batting order, so to speak. Anyway, um, so please, uh, Ms. Owen or, uh, or Mr. Rotundi, please please let me let me know if you have anything to say here. They might not. I just wanted to give it an opportunity. Yeah, I think. Give me about 20 to 30 minutes. I should be able to cover my <laughs> thoughts and opinion. Um, thank you. Uh, no. So I, um, Andy was kind enough to, you know, walk the area with me and, and obviously fill me in on the project. And um, one of my questions was in regarding the existing field. Um, there isn't really a lot of room on the other side of it to move it. So where would the the clay and stone dust infield go? Where would it end? Um, and, and he had a the tape measure out and, and it's, it's um, there's about 20, almost 20 feet of space there between the two 17, I think to be exact. So yep, they're two separate different playing fields. And again, my, my thought on it from, from taking a look at it, I think it's gonna be a great enhancement for the Deer Hill School, um, for the kids that, that attend there daily um, and for the softball players in the community. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Ms. Zone, do you have anything to add? Yeah. The only thing I would add is it's already been brought up is just our scheduling. Um, you no, know, we, we have a scheduling, we have a calendar within the business office, um, just to make sure that, you know, we don't, we don't conflict with, or they don't conflict with some of the school, school usage. That's all. Okay. The only other thing I'd add, Chair McClellan, is that um, in speaking with uh, Principal Sullivan at the Deer Hill School, she's certainly thrilled, as am I, with any enhancements that can happen to our, our, our schools. And, you know, I look at this as, it's really a revitalization of something that was already there. It's not, it's not quite a new, a new field. It's a, we're, we're making it into what it should be. Uh, so just a note there. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Um, Mr. Kearney, getting back to your point, um, I, it is not my understanding, Mr. Sims, um, and Mr. Chase, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It is not, is my understanding that, that, um, that you're not seeking any funding from the district, uh, that this project is, you know, regardless of where the funding actually comes from, I know that uh, the CPC has a, uh, you know recommended nineteen thousand um, dollars, but you're not seeking any money from the district, and that that was that was that's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's correct. correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Paul's, I think, if I may, I think Paul's question is whether we will raise whatever, um, sorry, waive whatever fees we would normally charge them for field usage. Right, because I think that's what you were asking for earlier, Andy, and I know you alluded to it's, it's not a deal breaker. However, uh, maybe we can to um, uh, maybe we make a 
for five years or uh, 10 years or I don't know. I'm just, I'm trying to um, answer that because I think that's what you said, Andy, right? Two, you wanted two things from us, a vote to approve it. And the other one was to waive the fees, correct? Right, yeah, in a nutshell, th right, those two items, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just asking the other committee members, what are your thoughts? about that certain part of the legislation there. Can I make a suggestion? Can we consider making a motion to approve the project as long as it's budget, budget neutral for us that we don't have to invest any uh, of our financial resources in it and that we table the issue of usage fees for next meeting so that we can have a more accurate picture of what that means. I think that's a great idea. I think that's financially responsible as well to see exactly what it, what it would cost and what we're talking about. I I'm not, a, I, I think it makes perfect sense. I just don't know, you know enough about the whole picture to feel comfortable making a motion about that right now, but I. Well, okay. I don't, I don't think that we need to necessarily commit to what the waiver of any fees right now. I mean, we can revisit that at, at a later time, like you mentioned, I don't think it has to be next meeting either. I mean, I think that, you know, Mr. Sims and Mr. Chase, if we if we approve the project, you're going to have to presume that you know there is no waiver that those you know I mean you can seek that at some time. But as far as I'm concerned, we're looking at you know whether or not uh, we're interested in allowing this sort of project to take place. And uh, I, I mean, I don't want to make that contingent upon anything. I mean, if you're if you're able to do it with without any sort of waiver, um, great. I mean, I, I think that that's a de that's dependent that that feature of this is dependent on on something that we can't answer at this time isn't that correct yeah that's that's right we, we don't have to it was, it was those two those are two kind of like um yeah separate independent things like basically permission to do the project and then the thing about the the fee waiver can be we can put that off for the future or you know it's not it's not a deal breaker it's just an idea that's right thank you mrs marr yeah, I'd just like to clarify, because I took a note during Mr. Sims's presentation regarding the facility use fee, is that if um, the, the project is funded through CPC, then the CYBSA's request was to have the same fees as other sports that use our facilities. But mm -hmm. if CYBSA ends up funding this, then they would like to have a conversation about a fee waiver is that correct that's correct okay, okay. thank you perfect it just it just to clarify um you know the point about the cpc funding of this we've been to to repeat this uh, we've been before cpc and we requested 50 percent funding and cpc granted us 100% funding. So if they stay with that, uh, which I hope they do, uh, I think we're going to revisit that, uh, that project at uh, the next uh, CPC meeting. But if we stay with that vote, um, then we don't need to speak about it because we're not paying anything. We're just overseeing the project and CPC is paying for it. Um, if there's a different vote, uh, then I think we can talk about it later. That's that's kind of how we're looking at it. Agree here. Okay. So everyone, okay, what I'm looking for right now is a motion to uh, approve uh, permission for the project. Is there a motion to that effect on the floor? So moved. Okay, the motion is made by Mr. Kearney. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Marr. All in favor, roll call. Mrs. Kaliri. Aye. Mr. Kearney. Aye. Mrs. Marr. Aye. Mrs. St. Orange. Aye. Aye. Craig McClellan, that motion unanimously passes. So congratulations, Mr. Sims and Mr. Chase. Thank you for presentation. Uh, you have the authorization to move forward with the project, obviously working with the district administration and central office in doing so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both on behalf of the schools. It's wonderful to see this. Thank you. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Sullivan, moving on to the next agenda item. Pardon me. Uh, absolutely, Chair McClellan. Chase, you can um, leave the meeting. Yes. The, thank you. <laughs> um, and if uh, Athletic Director Rotundi can stick in for a second here, I know 
uh, I, I had hoped that we would be able to talk about our turf and um, track at this point, and I'll leave it to you, Chair McClellan, to initiate the discussion as you see fit. But but Athletic Director Rotundi is here again for any questions or any help he may be able to add. Thank you. Well, I know that Mrs. Marr has put a great deal of effort and time into this particular topic, so I, I would defer to her first if, if she wants to, you know, open the conversation about this in any way. Mrs. Marr, is that something that you'd like to do? Um, okay. Um, can we can we unshare the softball field before other stuff happens? Is that yeah. possible? <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Um, so the... Um, uh, I, I don't know where to start. I'm a little unprepared. So the um, we have two projects that, that are wrapped together, replacing the carpet on the turf field. The turf field went in and opened on or about September 19th, 2009, and um, had a 10 year life expectancy. And through very diligent efforts and upkeep and maintenance, and grooming with exceeded the, the life by a couple of years. Um, and it's time for it to be replaced. The GMAX testing uh, indicates it's still safe. However, the fibers, the nylon fibers in the field for those of us who are out there with Mrs. Owen and some others on that frigid, frigid day, um, they're, they're falling flat, which means that there's no, um, the athletes, um, can't uh, pivot, they can't stop, they can't, um, you know, turn like in, in, in their footwear the way that they should be. And, and the nylon filaments are beginning to lay flat and don't have the spring back. So it is time um, for the turf carpet to be replaced. That um, replacement cannot be funded by community preservation based on uh, the bylaws of, of that uh, entity within the state of Massachusetts. Um, and so we have put forth that item to capital budgets. The track um, goes back to the renovation of alumni stadium, well, the creation of alum, alumni stadium, I wanna say in the early 2000s, and it has been resurfaced, but it has never been replaced. The group that put the track in uh, that put the turf in in 2009 uh, didn't have the funding to replace the track. It was resurfaced. We resurfaced it again a few years ago, hoping to extend the life a little bit and the life of the track. It's beyond end of life and um, there's significant issues with the track. Now CPC can fund the track. They funded um, the track replacement over at Situate High School. Situate High School had a huge project uh, they replaced the turf carpet on their main stadium field. They replaced the track, which was one foot higher on one side than the other, if you can believe it. And they installed two new turf playing surfaces at the high school complex. Um, and that was all done through um, public, uh, public money and CPC money and no private money. So um, at Capital Budgets Monday night, as they reviewed the request, they voted five to zero to fund the turf um, replacement, turf carpet replacement. Uh, CPC voted, um, I think we commented on this before, $375,000 towards the track replacement and, and Capital Budgets funded the other, I think it's 120,000 to complete the track to the specifications that Athletic Director Rotunde uh, has laid out. So um, I, you know, as we just learned, or as the CYBSA group learned, you know, um, CPC funding starts for the next fiscal year. So it's July 1 when that money becomes available. Same with the capital budget money. Um, but I think the goal, um, unless there's new developments, is to try to get it done this summer. And I think it's like a, four to six week project, one phase is done first and then the other phase is done after. And that's kind of all I know at this point. Okay. Um, all right, so I mean, uh, Athletic Director Rotundi, do you have anything to add to it? No, I think that um, is really up to speed of where we're at. I wanted to share with the group that I do have from um, one of the companies that is involved in it. They actually sent um, last week just a couple of um, 
printer size paper, but uh, full detailed and colored uh, renderings of what the, the field and track would look like, um, the specifications, and also a sample of the actual turf um, itself that would be laid down. So I do have that on site at the school um, to share uh, for anyone that, that wants to see that or take a look at it uh, as we move, potentially hopefully move forward. Okay, any members of the uh, school committee have uh, any comments or questions, Mrs. Kaleri? I do not, thank you. Mr. Kearney? Oh, I think it's great. Um, it is, uh, it's been there 10 years, uh, 2009. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think it's time. Um, my daughter's playing on there for soccer, gets a lot of use, a lot of folks in town like to run the track and um, yeah. Uh, I, I think it would be a great thing for the community. Thank you, Ms. Kearney. Ms. St. Orange? Um, no comment. Just sounds like a great plan. It definitely needs to be to be updated. So it's awesome that that can happen. Okay. Um, Mrs. M oh, Mrs. Marty, you have a comment? Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry. I just have, um, Steve, maybe you can talk about the, the vendor that you've been working with and how they finance it and, and the I assume you're going to proceed with them, the co-op, so that you don't have to put it out to bid. Um, I think both options are on the table. So there, there is a company uh, called Field Turf that we've been working with kind of the beginning, and they've done some repairs to our turf. Um, and I guess in going back a little bit to include to the conversation, going back to the blades on the field falling flat down and Really, with any turf field, its, it's biggest en enemy is the sun. And once those blades go from standing straight up to down, um, like Ms. Marr touched on with the impact of the kids running back and forth, but then the sun can really get at it. And when the blades are straight up, that's what pushes the sun in the opposite direction. So once it's down, it starts to deteriorate the field and it goes fast. So I think if um, for health and safety purposes, the field is okay right now, but we'd also have to just understand that going forward, we'll have to continue to put a financial investment in it. This year, um, we replaced uh, about a dozen seams that were getting ripped up and that will continue to happen. Um, so that's just something of, and, and making an overall decision that financially we will have to keep investing into the field to keep it going, moving forward. Um, but going back, the company Field Turf, yes, they have a corporate um, purchasing program where uh, they're able to take care of all the procurement through the vendors that they use and, and they can really walk us through the entire process. Um, I've spoke to their vendor recently the, their, and their sales rep who would be willing to come on and do a presentation to this group or a group in town if they wanted to. Um, but I have had conversations where um, we still may want to put it out to bid. So um, I think that's something I would present to this entire group and Dr. Sullivan um, to make a decision at the town level as well if they wanted to hear out Field Turf's proposal of how they're able to do it successfully, or if they, you know, respectfully want to decline that offer and go in a in a different direction. And I've heard both versions. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, it's obviously something that needs to be done, Miss um, Mar. I mean, are we looking for some sort of a vote right now? Is this more of sort of notice uh, information or what? what? Uh, I I didn't. I don't think I put it on the agenda. Um, or requested it. No, it, it, it's, it's been, we've ta been talking about this as part of the capital budget uh, um, requests. So uh, I don't, unless the committee would like to have an official vote, I don't think it needs a vote. Okay, um, I agree. Um, so moving on, Dr. Sullivan. Yes, um, absolutely. So uh, next um, we have a few, um, kind of business items. The first is a dispose, disposal of surplus materials. These are middle school math texts. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, if I can. Pardon me. I will not share my screen, <laughs> but I will tell you what they are. They're algebra uh, structure and method books, copyright 2000. So they're over 20 years old. Um, there are 38 of them. Estimated value of the bunch is $100. So 
So we'd like permission to uh, be able to um, dispose of those if we if we can gather that from the committee. So I guess we need to vote for disposal of those materials. Okay, great. So some updated textbooks that we need to dispose of. Is there a motion in that effect on the floor? So moved. Motion made by Mr. St. Ange. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Scaleri. All in favor, Ms. Scaleri. Aye. Ms. Kearney. Aye. Ms. Marr. Aye. Ms. St. Ange. Aye. Aye. Craig McClellan. Motion unanimously passes, Dr. Sullivan. So those can be disposed of. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and then I move on, uh, Chairman McClellan, to gifts. We have a few gifts on the agenda today. Um, the first is a is really a donation. Um, there will be no. This will be a, a donation from the PSO, and I'll read this uh, recognition for uh, from them uh, in recognition of the resiliency of our dedicated school staff and our students over the course of this last year. The Cohasset PSO would like to plant a tree to show our appreciation for the teachers and staff of the Cohasset School District. We hope this tree will not only honor our teachers, but serve as a reminder of how the school community came together this year to make sure that our children received the support that they needed. So it's a strict donation. Um, if the committee uh, approves of this, we would be working uh, as a leadership team to choose an appropriate place for the tree that would, of course, when working with um, Kennedy uh, Country Gardens and Chris Kennedy, uh, would be appropriately placed to not cause any damage to anything or be uh, structurally prohibitive or put in a place that would be inappropriate. And the type of tree, I believe, is yet to be determined, but certainly working with Chris as an expert, we'd be able to find something that would be, again, appropriate for our uh, con confines and structures. It's a really great gesture. And so I guess I'll do these one at a time and I'll leave it to you, uh, Chair McClellan, um, regarding this. Unless you want to take a vote on all of them at once. I think I uh, vote on them all at once. Okay. The next gift then um, is, this is a gift uh, to our arts um, program. Um, and it is from Awesome Blossom. Actually, on second thought, Dr. Sullivan, I think we have to do it individually. You do? Uh, so let's just take, a, take them one at a time. Um, you got it. Okay, for the record. Um, is there a motion uh, on the floor to accept the PSO donation for the tree? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Kearney. Seconded? I seconded. Oh. Seconded by Mr. St. Ange. All in favor, Mrs. Caleri? Aye. Mr. Kearney? Aye. Mar. Aye. St. Ange? Aye. Craig McClellan, aye, with appreciation. Thank you so much. That motion unanimously passes. That gift's accepted. Thank you, but Dr. Sullivan, can you move on to the uh, next uh, gift? I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you before. Not a problem at all, and I'm just gonna get it off the screen there, but it's from Awesome Blossom. And it's for our arts program for $1,437. Um, they've graciously donated in the past and they'd like to do that again. Okay, uh, thank you. Is there a motion on the floor to, uh, to approve this gift? So moved. moved. <clears throat> motion made by Ms. Kearney, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Caleri, all in favor. Mrs. Caleri. Aye. Mr. Kearney. Aye. Mrs. Marr. Aye. St. Ange. Aye. Hi, Craig McClellan, that motion passes, so that gift is accepted. Dr. Sullivan, with appreciation, thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Chair McClellan. The next uh, gift is from uh, the Clark, uh, I'm sorry, it's from the South Shore Playhouse Associates, which is um, the South Shore Music Circus. And uh, the payee is the Clark Chatterton Memorial Fund at Cohasset High School Athletic Department. So this is to our athletic department, and it's of the amount of $2,500. Again, they they graciously donate this um, yearly and would like to accept it if we can. Okay, uh, is, there, uh, is there a motion forward to accept uh, this generous gift? So moved. Motion made by Mrs. Mars, there a second? Second. Second. Seconded <laughs> by Mrs. St. Ange, all in favor. Mrs. Galeri? Aye. Mr. Kearney? Aye. Mrs. Marr? Aye. Mrs. St. Ange? Aye. Aye, Craig McClellan, Dr. Sullivan, that motion unanimously passes. That gift is accepted with appreciation. And uh, obviously, uh, whenever we have gifts, uh, it's just a, it's a huge boon to the district. And we really, really appreciate that. It's, it's a very generous thing. People don't have to do it. Um, and, and, you know, really, uh, to a degree, um, you know, uh, we really depend on it a lot of times, you know, and it makes a difference in a lot of ways. Uh, so Agreed. thank you all so much for, for, uh, for your generous gifts. 
Uh, Dr. Sullivan, can we move on? We sure will. The next item is um, uh, the 2021-22 uh, uh, Cohasset Public Schools calendar. I know I, I've um, provided this for the committee in advance of the meeting. Uh, so I won't go over it, but I'd be glad to answer any questions or, you know, um, respond to any concerns that the committee may have, but I'd be looking for a vote for this. I should note that uh, as is our contractual responsibility, we did uh, confer with the CTA regarding this and um, we gained a lot of insight from that collaboration um, and uh, reflected uh, a lot of those uh, suggestions within this calendar. Um, so we're presenting this for your potential approval. Uh, I'll leave it to you, Chair McClellan. Thank you. Any uh, uh, deliberation or comment from the school committee, Mrs. Caleri? No, thank you. Mr. Kearney? Uh, no, thank you. Mrs. Marr? No, thank you. Mrs. St. Ange? I just wanna say, I just still really love this new layout. It is just so user-friendly. So I appreciate the shift after we had our um, multiple calendars in the fall. I'm glad we're yeah, sticking with uh, it. A shout out to uh, Jennifer Savitas, my administrative assistant, and also uh, Dr. Scollins for doing some good work on this. Thank you for recognizing that, Lydia. Thank you, Mr. St. Ange. Uh, I have no comments. So, um, Dr. Sullivan, are you seeking um, any sort of vote on this? Yes, I am. I'm seeking a vote for the approval of the 2021-22 school calendar as presented. Okay, is there a motion to that effect on the floor? So moved. Motion made by Mrs. Caleri. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. St. Orange. All in favor, Mrs. Caleri. Aye. Mr. Kearney. Aye. Mrs. Marr. Aye. Mrs. St. Orange. Aye. Aye. Craig McClellan, Dr. Sullivan. That motion unanimously passes, and uh, the calendar for the 2021 2022 year is approved and accepted by the school committee. Wonderful, thank you. We will we'll publish that and post it and get it out to uh, the community um, tomorrow. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, if I can move on, I think next we have our special education, yeah, I should say our director of student services, um, Barbara Sawanka to do uh, an update on uh, student services. And I know this is a little bit more of a data presentation than um, in the past with some of the other uh, uh, items that we've reviewed. So I believe, Barbara, I provided you with uh, co-host powers, but if I didn't, I can. Okay, so I think you could feel free to share your screen and take it away. Thank you. All right. And if, if something happens, I also have it um, to share if, if you have a problem with sharing, although I didn't do so there well. There it is. All right, there we go. Okay. <laughs> So good evening, everyone. Um, I too shared this um, with the committee prior to this meeting. However, I have made some amendments to it. Um, some, some things still needed some looking into and some adjustments needed to be made. And um, I'm going to highlight those for you tonight. I'm not gonna read through the whole thing as you have read them as well. I'm going to go through what it, what it shows along with some additional information. And then I will get this amended version out to you tomorrow. So um, the Office of Student Services update, um, I show you here um, our district-wide positions, which include um, myself, our team chairs, our BCBA, a physical therapist, and the administrative assistant to the Office of Student Services. I then shared with you here, and I did make some adjustments to this, um, a summary of the special education students. Our in-district placements at this moment are numbering 203 with our out of districts at 23, bringing us to a total number of special education students at 226. Our percentages very much line up with the same percentages that were shared with you last year. I also broke down for you um, the categories of um, different qualifications of disability areas and um, how we break down across the district. And then I break it down um, on the different pages into the different schools, which I will touch on these areas. Um, if anyone has any questions while I'm doing so, I'm, I'm happy to stop and address it. Um, but like I said, I'm going to kind of touch on these areas that I know you've seen and highlight some of the changes that I have made. Um, the number of students at the Joseph Osgood School are pre-K to two. 
our preschool teacher, um, our little lunch bunch program, um, our STARS program for those identified students, and our two special um, education inclusion teachers, one of them who services K-1 and the other one who services K-2. In terms of related services, our um, two speech therapists, one full-time and one a point four. A school adjustment counselor devoted to the building and then a point five school adjustment counselor who you will see in our, our next one um, splits her time with the Deer Hill. Our uh, full-time occupational therapist, I had to, um, I, th this, this particular position was increased right before I came on board and I just had to make sure that it was evident everywhere that it had been increased before I um, assigned it here. So when I gave it to you, it was in its original 0.8, but all year long, this has been a full-time position. And um, our school psychologist who, for the elementary level, is half-time at the Osgood and half-time at the Deer Hill. Then we have the Deer Hill School, again, with um, the number of students who are currently on IEPs, our three through five. Um, our ILC program for students to require that level of support and our three special education inclusion teachers, one for each grade level there. And to get full-time speech therapist at this school, a full-time school adjustment counselor. And again, our 0.5 school adjustment counselor who splits with the Osgood, a 0.6 occupational therapist and our school psychologist who splits her time with the Osgood. Are there any questions right now about the elementary level? Okay. If we are to look at the secondary level um, at Cohasset Middle School, 44 students there currently on IEPs. Um, our language-based program, which provides special education student services for students who identify as need in that particular area. Our Intermediate Learning Center program, again, um, kind of fed a little bit, if you will, but also identified by individual need um, from the Deerhill program up here to the middle school. Our three middle school special education teachers, one at each grade level in inclusion and also providing other needs. And then um, I want to explain a little bit of this, our, our speech therapist who shared with the high school, a full-time school adjustment counselor here at the middle school level, a part-time occupational therapist shared with the high school, and then a full-time school psychologist. What we did here when I came on board in July was a school adjustment counselor position had been approved by the school committee. There was at that time um, a school psychologist serving both schools and there were two school adjustment counselors. And in talks with the school psychologist, um, the principals and um, superintendent, um, what we determined at the time was that school psychologists, and we see this as a trend, have the capacity to both test and counsel. And more and more of our graduates are really interested in having both of those capabilities and have great skill in both areas to be able to do that. And to confine at this point in time, school psychologists to testing only, um, it is not a high interest in a lot of recent graduates with this degree um, and could be a little bit confining. In fact, our, our own school psychologist at the secondary level was interested in being able to directly service students in somewhat of a, a counseling mode, not just in a testing mode. So what we did was we used that and assigned a school adjustment counselor and a school psychologist to the middle school, assigned a school adjustment counselor and a new school psychologist also um, to the high school. It turned out that our new school psychologist was a middle school hire, um, but that was how we divided that out. And that is how all of those services are able to be provided. So our two school psychologists, one at the middle and one at the high school are able to do both the testing that we need and counseling of students. And we still have a school adjustment counselor at each school able to do counseling of students. And I have to say the, um, 
reviews from the department, from both of the schools, and from the staff who are providing these services have um, just been excellent this year. Everyone is very happy with the level of service, the way this has gone, the different ways that this has been able to meet the needs of students in this kind of COVID-19 world. You can imagine we really needed to catch up and um, be aware of a great deal of testing that we needed to do for our students, but we've also been able to um, perhaps expand some of our counseling services and ideas for students. I know one of our school psychologists is running an executive functioning group for general ed and special education students, things of that nature. So this has been really um, an, a nice move and it looks like a move in the right direction. So that is how that position kind of came about. If we were to look at our high school, we can see that um, 49 students currently there um, on IEPs. We have our AIMS program there at the high school, a partial inclusion program, um, depending upon students' individual level of needed supports. Our three special education inclusion teachers um, who provide um, inclusion within the general ed setting, but also in special education settings. And um, as I just outlined for you, our school adjustment counselor, our school psychologist, and our shared occupational therapist and speech therapist with um, the middle school. And um, as I said, I've made some small amendments to this and I will reshare this with you in hard copy tomorrow um, after the meeting. Um, I do have a couple of other um, notes of interest for you. If um, everyone is done with this and I can stop my share or if you have any questions on it. I do have a question. Can yes. I ask a question? Mr. Chairman, it's okay. Um, this might be, I know there's no such thing as a stupid question, but this might be one. Um, so wondering if, so, so are all of the in-district placements meant to be reflected in each school? So that, that is a good question because oh. when students <laughs> qualify yeah. um, for an initial evaluation, they come under our umbrella right away. So they, they are not actually qualified for special education, but they are undergoing an initial evaluation. So they come into our account because they are receiving all of kind of the protections and the rights and the privileges within the department. So the actual number there is not going to be the same number as all of the students who are added up from each of the schools, Thank nor you. is it going to be the same number if you were to add up um, the summary of the disability categories, because some of those initial evaluation students, you know, may qualify for services, some may not. It is only after that point in time that we would recognize the disability category under which they qualified if they did so and so on and so forth. Got it. So yeah, the, the numbers are not perfectly going to add up to each other all of the time. Thank you. And then I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, um, the inclusion models in the, in the elementary level, like how many sections are being co-taught? Do you know, like in, by grade? So that's, um, that model is a little bit different than it is at the secondary level. At the secondary level, we can tell you course-wise because they are true kind of courses, both in the middle school and the high school, how many sections are truly co-taught. At, at the elementary level, what we see is we see both our special educators and our ESPs pushing into the general classroom whenever there are student needs in there as they are scheduled into those programs and um, across the different teachers at those grade levels as they are needed to. So, you know, I, I can't say to you, oh, you know, there's someone in algebra one and there's someone in, you know, this English class because as the students are scheduled in and as we look at their needs, then some of the pullout happens on an individually scheduled basis. And also some of the push-in happens both from the elementary special educators and the ESPs, depending upon students who are in those classes and what their needs are. And as certainly as many changes as there have been this year, 
there have been a lot of those changes too. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Clear. Any any um any other questions, Mr. Kearney? A uh, great presentation. Uh, I, I know you had a CPAC meeting this week as well. Actually, our CPAC meeting needed to be pushed to next week. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kearney. Mrs. Marr, do you have any comments or points of discussion? Uh, I'd just like to thank Mrs. Saranto for the report. I think it's um, always good for us to understand exactly how many students we're, we're servicing in special education. We're down about you know 10% from our last report in September of 19. Um, and the numbers are down uh, the most at the secondary level, uh, particularly the high school. And I don't know what, if anything, we can attribute that to other than just the fact that, you know, kids, kids, you know, graduate and leave the pro, you know, leave the school and new kids go into the school. I, but I'm wondering if the co-teaching that we've had in place now in the middle school has really helped kids uh, become better prepared for the high school. I would like to think certainly that the kids are really kind of getting those skills on board. And like you said, Ellen, are more prepared when they get up to the high school level. Um, the, the other piece of information that um, I was going to share with you just early tonight was that um, I took a look at our initial referrals and this kind of piggybacks and might answer a little bit of the question you just had from September of 2019 until April 1st of 2020. So of last year, our initial referrals totaled 73. 46 of those were at the elementary level and 27 were at the secondary level. This year, the same time frame, September of 2020 to April of 1st of 2021, our total initial referrals are 63. We have had 48 at the elementary level, which is virtually the same, and we are down 10 at the secondary level. We have been only had 17 um, secondary referrals. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think we can draw a straight line to exactly what it is. I, I have done a little bit of questioning and research on this. I think some of it certainly is, um, you know, that our, our co-teaching model, as you have seen, is getting stronger, it's expanding. We're, we're looking for an, another um, teacher in that for next year. Um, but I also have heard too that last year kind of was a little bit of a bump in terms of referrals. That last year looked high compared to the previous year and the year previous to that, this year might look a little bit um, more similar to those. And, and perhaps last year was a little bit of an outlier. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Mrs. Marr. Mrs. St. Ange, do you have any questions for Mrs. Sirwanka? I guess my only question is um, maybe just an extension of your discussion about the school counselors and school therapists. And I, I, I think that's a great transition. I think every, school that I've worked in in the recent years has done the same thing. And it's so nice. Um, mm -hmm. I know that many of the kids that I work with have a feelings teacher and it's often the school psychologist. So it's great to have that person um, both testing and, um, and providing services to students. Um, is there, I'm just curious, and I just can't think of um, if it has been presented to me as a parent. I'm just wondering if that is shared with families just because I, I just feel like all of this information is so great and maybe I'm just paying closer attention when I'm at a school committee meeting. Um, uh -huh. But you know, just like that, that shift in roles is so nice to understand or you know, like any, any sort of, is that done um, you know, at, at orientation nights or at open house nights? I just can't remember receiving that information. I just think it would be nice to just to have kind of the general population know about that, even, even if it doesn't apply to their child. I just think it's so nice to know all of those resources. And, you know, sometimes you just need it for a couple of days and sometimes you need it for, for a long time, but I'm just curious if that's absolutely shared. Yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of, you know, everyone knowing the resources and, and, you know, as everyone knows, as kind of the director of student services and not just special education, I really am about all children and providing resources that kids need. Um, I think that this year was really unusual 
Um, certainly with, with COVID and everything else going on, I, I know that, um, you know, I did some sharing of some of this information, you know, both on my, on my webpage and through my CPAC and things like that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, um, in, in terms of, you know, individual school parent nights and things like that, um, I, I, I honestly think that other things were kind of taking precedence. Sure. Um, but I totally hear you saying that, you know, these are really good things to explain, to offer, to celebrate, to make aware, um, you know, for families. And um, I look forward to doing that um, with the principals perhaps next year. Yeah, I think that would be great. I just think, you know, when in doubt, err on the side of over communication. Absolutely. And, and these, these um, you know, these are really, really amazing people who are part of our staff who can help mm -hmm. so many kids. So um, just good to be able to expand that definition for everybody. Yeah, and I, I have to say one of the first things that um, Barbara did when she came on was collaborate with us regarding that. And she really had some great ideas about the benefits of it. And it's, it's absolutely paid off. So it was nice, right up, right hitting the ground running. She immediately provided us with some guidance. So that was great. What's up? <laughs> Thank it was like you. A dead, awesome. dead silence. I had Sorry. Yes. I was just <laughs> struggling to unmute. No, thank no, you very okay. much for that information. Mrs. Sir Wonk, I just wonder, um, do we ever seek family feedback uh, in some um, in some organized fashion? Uh, like, so say, a survey that's sent uh, specifically to uh, families um, that utilize student services um, so we can get an idea of how we're doing on either an annual or uh, mm -hmm. some sort of regular basis. We do something like that. I, I feel like I remember you, you've shared something like that in the past, but I don't know how often we do it. Mm -hmm. So I know. Um... You know, certainly we take feedback at, at all of our meetings and whenever paperwork is returned to us and things like that. I know, um, you know, in my previous district, one of the things that we did was we, we sent home surveys every time that there was an IEP meeting. And that was kind of a really nice thing to do because it was very regular and consistent feedback all the way along. And um, it is on kind of my list of things to see how we could, you know, feasibly and easily kind of implement that for next year. Um, you know, when it's a little bit more of a regular year and, um, and get that very consistent feedback all the way through the year, not just kind of at one point in time, so that it's a continually evolving practice and an improvement to our practice. Hey, also, um, Craig, I love the idea of, uh, you know, from the angle of Barbara being the director of student services, she's really, she's our go-to for every student situation, you know, so um, we're, it, that requires support. So to, to really get our feelers out there for that through the, through the building principles, particularly as we're moving to present a, a new strategic plan, I think is a great idea um, and something that uh, you know, I know Barbara does kind of naturally, but, you know, to make it a little more intentional, I think is a really great suggestion. Agreed. So, yeah. Uh, you must post it on that as we enter the, uh, you know, into the summer and uh, start thinking about the next academic year. Thank, um, you. thank you so much for that uh, very important presentation. I'm, I'm obviously so happy that, you know, you're a regular addition to the meeting. Mrs. Sermonka, it's such an important facet of our operation. So thank you for all that you do um, for our kids. Um, Dr. Sullivan, um, and Mr. Sermonka, does that, does that conclude your, your update? It does, unless there are any further questions. I don't think there are, so uh, so, so thank you so much. Um, moving on to the next agenda item is the uh, school committee section. And we've already taken two of the lead agenda items off um, and had some, some fun discussion about that earlier. So um, we're moving into the, um, I think right into the policy revisions um, that have been suggested um, by or proposed by the policy subcommittee. And I will turn the meeting over to either um, Mrs. St. Ange or Mrs. Caleri. Happy to take it. Is that okay with you, Olivia? Yeah, lead the way. I'll chime in if I feel the need. Okay. So I think that I, I try, I would also love any feedback the committee has for the presentation that I 
tried to put together after our policy subcommittee meetings, we have this sort of master spreadsheet and we go through, we're trying to go through, as I said, by section to just sort of make sure our manual is aligning more closely with the mass policy reference. And so this is sort of like a, a sweep through the manual to make it more closely align. And then we'll revisit each section after we do this initial sweep. So the results of the uh, sweep of the first part of section G are included in the, pol uh, the policy binder that was in your packet for review. And I, I try to make it as sort of self-explanatory as I can. Um, and I don't want to, you know, bore everyone by reading through everything. So if it pleases the committee, I will just ask if anyone has any questions about the content. I think that's the way to go, Ms. Cleary, thanks. Does anyone have any questions? I don't, I don't have a question. I, I would just like to thank you and Lydia. I think the cover page is phenomenal. It's very clear and um, gets exactly to the point of what your recommendation is without a lot of wordsmithing and, you know, cross-referencing. It, it's clear and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So I think then if nobody has any questions, we would look for a motion to adopt the policy changes outlined herein. Yes, um, just a comment. I mean, I think that, you know, as we're, you know, as you mentioned, we're trying to align more with the mask uh, policies and, and, and exhibit some, some uniformity and consistency there. And I think that's a good, um, that's a, a, good, a good objective so long as it obviously doesn't depart from some sort of policies that are you know, necessary to our specific district. And, and, and for these particular recommendations, they're all fairly general and or superfluous. So I, I, I think that uh, you know, my personal opinion is that they're all positive uh, edits to the policy. Um, does anyone else have any comments at this time before we take any sort of motion? I mean, I know Ms. Cleary, Ms. St. Andre sort of jointly pre presenting, so, and Mrs. Mar's already been heard. So I guess I'm, I'm talking to you, Mr. Kearney. Do you have anything else to, to add? No, I'd just like to thank um, Lydia and uh, Ashley. They did a great job on this. This is great. Dr. Scollins is there every step of the way. I was going to say, Dr. Scollins is putting in oh, just I'm as sorry. much time. No, no, it, it, that's not. You wouldn't know that. Yeah. Just want to make sure we don't forget. <laughs> very well. fun. They work very hard. <laughs> All right. So um, is there a motion on the floor to accept the um, policy revisions as proposed by our policy subcommittee and as um, outlined on the cover sheet drafted by the policy subcommittee? So moved. Motion made by Mrs. Mars. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Kaleri. All in favor, Mrs. Kaleri? Aye. Mr. Kearney? Aye. Mrs. Marr? Aye. St. Ange? Aye. Aye. Craig McClellan, that motion unanimously passes, so we'll effectuate those revisions. Thank you so much for your work on that and your continued work. I know this is like something that's been ongoing and you guys have put a great deal of time into it. So thank you so much. It's really important. Thank you. Um, moving on is the uh, school facilities committee. I don't have an, an update, um, a substantive update right now. Um, I know I'm sort of the liaison there, so I don't have anything. Um, uh, reports from subcommittees, we'll just, uh, let's go in reverse alphabetical order unless Mr. St. Andrew is not prepared to do that. I kind of always <laughs> ambush you with that. I know, uh, sneak attack. I feel like it's such a treat for you to go first, but if, if you'd rather me just go in the na natural order of things, it's fine. No, that's fine. We can go backwards. All of my meetings are tomorrow. Literally everything is scheduled for tomorrow. So I'll get you next time. <laughs> okay, well, we'll look, look forward to hearing from you on okay. the 21st then. Um, Mrs. Mrs. Marr. Um, just quickly, I watched uh, Capital Budgets on Monday night and uh, a lot of our requests they voted positively to recommend to the select board uh, and to put forth on the town warrant. It was the bus lease, the sprinkler system at Osgood, the track and the turf we already discussed, the Chromebook lease, the wood shop uh, dust collection system has been approved, um, pilot technology, they've allocated uh, 32,000 of the 64,000 asked for, 
uh, the science lab retrofit to make that room. Um, I think it's 196, a true science lab and the door fobs uh, for security for in, um, egress and, and, and entering uh, for staff members um, so that they can get outside. Um, they still have questions um, and want a bigger plan from the town, not from us necessarily, uh, in terms of the uh, sidewalk and curbing up around the uh, by alumni field and up and around the circle. The snow plowing uh, destroys the curbing and they'd like a solution to that before repairing it. Um, and so I thought it was very positive. We got the largest allocation in my history, million seven, um, which I think is, is pretty terrific. Um, so thanks to Mrs. Owen and uh, Dr. Sullivan for all their hard work. Oh, and I didn't mention, I apologize, the air handlers. They approved the funding for the air handlers for the Deer Hill and the Middle High School, which was big money and we know that those need to be replaced. And um, so that's it. Yeah, if I can just add, Craig, um, just a big thank you to the Capital Committee on behalf of our um, of the Grass of Public Schools. That's hard work and they're very analytical and thoughtful and it's their generosity is really appreciated um, for the kids, so thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Mrs. Moran. Thank you to all who were uh, intimately involved in that. And uh, I do echo the sentiments of Dr. Sullivan on behalf of the school committee uh, for the capital budget um, group. It was uh, more notes. Um, it's a large allocation and, and we're very fortunate um, to have received that. And, you know, the district's obviously in need and um, appreciate that greatly. Um, Mr. Kearney. Yeah, I, I'd just like to give a, a shout out to the PSO for all the hard work they did with the, um, I think Dr. Sullivan so graciously showed us the chalk and the going around and, and I was part of that driving around picking stuff up and um, it was wonderful to see. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, as a middle school father too, to see uh, Jack see his friends that he hasn't seen for a year. And uh, it was unbelievable. And it was just, I'm so grateful. And thank you, uh, Dr. Scholars, Dr. Sullivan, all your staff, you guys. Uh, another shout out to Ron Ford too, for his program with, uh, and my son Jack loves it, the middle yes. school the cross country team. Yes. And, you know? He's running a mile and a half, the kid's running, and uh, it's great. Yeah, I had meant to update on that, uh, Paul. We do have, with the committee's uh, knowledge, we have about 50 students out from our middle school in a middle school cross-country program, and really, um, Coach Ford and Coach, um, I know her first name, Sage, I think it's, it begins with a B, I, I apologize, but uh, their, their work has been amazing, plus the high school students are helping. What a way to yep. grow a program. And yeah. just back to the PSO, um, I didn't probably emphasize that enough, but they did a lot of work with that. It was it was really great to see. And the CEF also um, donated uh, some donuts and goodies to the teacher's room. I tried to stay away from there as much as I could, <laughs> but it was um, because of the donuts. <laughs> yeah. But it was uh, a lovely gesture. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Yeah, and then uh, that um, dog incident <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, we had a dog. There was a um, uh, just a little uh, humor, but the dog was weaving it. No, this isn't funny. The dog was <laughs> weaving in and out of traffic, and ap actually, um, Paul's wife Tracy and I were kind of uh, talking as the cars were coming up. So Tracy ended up taking the dog, and we ended up. Uh, tr I, I believe the dog was picked up, but we ended up having a sit the situated animal mm -hmm. shelter after a few att attempts to try to find the dog's <laughs> owner. The dog did not like me at all, just for the record. It seemed to like everybody except for me. So not a fan of the go out superintendent. But it was very nice of Tracy to help with that. Uh, a lot of humor in there. <laughs> yeah. It's always something. Yeah, it's a great way to start the start the week. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Dr. Sullivan, uh, former uh, Former committee member uh, Barbara Steffen just uh, chimed in and uh, noted that the name um, that you were searching for was a Sage Belber. That's right, uh, Coach Belber. Thank you um, very much, Barbara. 
Okay, uh, so um, I don't have any updates unless there's anything else from the school committee members, comments, updates. Mrs. Marr, it looks like you're about to wait, raise your hand. So sorry, I apologize. Um, we found out last night or this morning that uh, the select board is anticipating our budget presentation on Tuesday evening at the select board joint meeting with advisory. It's coming Tuesday at seven. Yep, we're uh, preparing for that, I think. Dr. Sullivan, you're ready for that? Yeah, I'll be working with um, Sue and uh, you know we'll be definitely sharing with committee members to make sure we're, we're ready to go and have uh, you know, a proper presentation that will you know, anticipate questions that may come our way. And I know that Dr. Collins has also been working uh, a bit to uh, provide a little more data behind some of our um, positions and just to make it concise uh, for, for a presentation purpose to let the uh, select people know, uh, persons know exactly what, um, what and why we are advocating for. Mrs. Marr, thank you for communicating that information from us. I know that you were the one who sort of uh, discovered that. Yes. First. Um, okay, unless there's anything further, we'll move on. Um, which is uh, to approval of minutes, which I don't think there are any minutes to be approved in this meeting. None tonight. We will have them next meeting after vacation. Okay. And I don't think there are any topics that were not reasonably anticipated, which moves us to our uh, executive session. There's no reason that I know of to move into executive session at this time. And finally, is there a motion to adjourn the meeting uh, at this time? So moved. Motion to adjourn has been made by Mrs. Caleri. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. St. Ange. All in favor, Mrs. Caleri? Aye. Mr. Kearney? Aye. Mrs. Marr? Aye. St. Ange? Aye. Aye. Craig McClellan, that motion unanimously carries, and the meeting is adjourned at 8.31 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Great, great night, week. Everybody. Great April break, too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye.